All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Donald Bowers. I work at the Federal Reserve Bank, and I'm also a member of the board at Children at Risk. And so on behalf of my colleagues on the board and the staff at Children at Risk, I want to thank you for joining today's event. As most of you know, Children at Risk is a nonprofit research and advocacy nonprofit dedicated to understanding and addressing root causes of child poverty and inequality. Our mission is to serve as a catalyst for change to improve children's quality of life through strategic research, public policy advocacy, education, collaboration, convenings, and advocacy. Nearly seven decades after Brown versus Board of Education, segregation and systemic racism are still part of our education system. And the pandemic has placed renewed attention on how historic and ongoing challenges continue to produce economic and racial disparities in our economic system, ultimately preventing children from reaching their full potential. Today's subject caused me to reflect on my own educational experience and how segregation and integration impacted my early years. As a child entering kindergarten in 1973, my parents, especially my mother, made it a top priority to put me and my brother in the best public schools possible. And if you'll indulge me, I wanna share a photo to give you a sense of what that was like. If someone could hit me in the chat to let me know that the picture came through. And also, maybe you can tell me which one of these students is me. As you can see, at that time, school integration was a, uh, a top priority. And for my mother, it was about putting us in the best school situation possible. And so for me, that meant a series of transitions from kindergarten through sixth grade where I ultimately attended five different elementary schools. Before we were able to find stability in middle school and the Bowers boys became known for being dedicated students. But as a member of the Board of Children at Risk, one of the things that I've learned is that what happens to children who don't have Shirley Bowers as their mother, who has the capacity to do the research and take the necessary measures to put their children in the best schools possible, who take the risk to go and petition HISD for a transfer because she didn't want her son going to middle school at the time. She wanted him to stay in sixth grade. And so she sent us to, sent us to another elementary school. She was committed to driving across town when necessary and then even making changes in our own decisions after she made them when she found out maybe two or three weeks later that the transition of moving from one school to the next uh, was the equivalent of spending 10 to 12 hours in the classroom and on the bus on a daily basis. Through today's convening, we're going to learn how 21st century school segregation impacts student academic experiences today about how policy change needed to combat, about the policy change needed to combat school resegregation and how to produce more inclusive learning experiences for all students. Before closing my opening remarks, I wanna thank our partners for making today's event possible. The Texas Family Leadership Council, Families Empowered, RGV Focus, Texas Appleseed, Change Happens, and then most importantly, our friends at Shell Oil Company. With that, I will turn the program over to Dr. Fraser Wilson, VP of Shell Oil Company Foundation and Director of Workforce Development and Diversity Outreach. More importantly, Fraser is a former Children at Risk board member, and one of children at risk, 30 most influential, most influential leaders. Dr. Wilson, the program is yours. Thanks, thanks, Donald. And thanks for sharing, sharing that picture. I have a similar picture from the same time frame grow, growing up in Illinois. So we know the 
the experiences of being those who integrated school systems during, during this time. But first, I want to thank uh, Children at Risk, the staff and the sponsors, and the other educators who will be joining us today. This is a, a great topic to address and the importance of it for our economy and for our workforce. At Shell, we're looking for the brightest minds to address the greatest STEM challenges, and we can't do this alone. And we need to ensure that we're working with everyone to bring about the greatest innovation and creative minds to address the challenges in diverse backgrounds. We need to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to compete and succeed and have opportunity to strive in this environment. Our work to, great, to generate greater awareness in STEM begins in kindergarten, where we try to spark interest early in math and science, how it can actually be fun or lead to rewarding careers, and careers that change the future for over uh, 1.2 billion people around the world currently without access to energy or basic uh, necessities like food and water to equip them for a better life. Our efforts in K-12 also include uh, supporting children and parents with uh, back to school preparation, with school supplies, immunizations, uh, dental screening, and for teachers, some of our, our greatest effort and our most valued stakeholders are our teachers with partnerships like Children at Risk and Smithsonian to build collaborations to attract and retain uh, diverse STEM teachers to help in this space, to help generate that interest in careers that are important and oftentimes students don't have the role models to see that this is a possibility for them. So we wanna to applaud the teachers for their efforts in this space. And as we as we move forward, as, as you have an opportunity to hear from the different panelists, please share your, your experiences, um, share what things you've seen that, that works. At the end of the day, we all want strong communities, strong families, and having a strong educational foundation as one of the keys to, to making that happen. So we look forward to the panel today. Thank Children at Ritz again for including Shell and being a partner as we address the challenges moving forward and take advantage of the opportunities that we have before us. So thanks again, Donald, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Dr. Wilson, it's so good to see you, sir. Uh, it has been uh, a long year and a half, two years and your, your beard is coming in nicely. <laughs> I, I, I'm working it. I see we still have the same barber, so we're doing great. We're doing great, doing great. Well, um, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Wilson. And, and one of the things that we want to make sure everyone knows is today's session is intended to be interactive. And so we would appreciate your questions uh, or your comments in the chat. We will have folks monitoring both the Q&A and the question section. And um, today's program is actually broken into four different sessions and a keynote. And our first session is on mapping discriminatory practices. And we have um, Robert Nelson, who is director of Digital Scholarship Lab and head of digital engagement at Boatwright Library. He's going to share some of his research on mapping discriminatory practices in the education space. Mr. Nelson? The floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having me today. Um, really a pleasure. This is a really important topic, and I'm uh, I'm grateful I have an opportunity to uh, participate and, and contribute. Um, today, I'm going to provide a little bit of historical perspective. Um, I uh, I'll just say up front, I'm not an expert on uh, on schools, contemporary schools. I'm an historian, um, and what I want to do today is I want to talk uh, a bit about the relationship uh, between real estate practices in the 20th century uh, and as an example of uh, systemic and structural racism that continues to have this kind of lasting impact, uh, you know, generations later. Uh, a century later on uh, inequalities today. And I will be talking a little bit using some some research that's um, been done using uh, the data set I'm going to talk about, uh, the redlining data set that collaborators and I have put together um, that does uh, look at correlations between um, school performance, uh, segregation, uh, diversity, in and funding in schools today, and the redlining uh, grades, which I'll talk a little bit about and introduce you to. Uh, back in the 1930s. Um, and I guess the point I, I will just kind of telegraph the point uh, I want to make, which is um, I 
I don't want to suggest that redlining uh, is the cause of, of inequalities we see in schools today. That's that's uh, overstating it. But I do think redlining uh, and the, the data I'm going to talk about, the, the evidence from the 1930s I'm going to talk about, um, is an example of uh, structural or systemic racism um, in the 20th century that was uh, advanced and endorsed by the federal government and uh, by finance, private financial institutions. And we can't think of like, what is more structural um, than the federal government and uh, the financial uh, infrastructure of, uh, of the US. Um, that that together um, really does sustain, advance, uh, and is still uh, still a problem in terms of uh, of the inequalities we uh, we see in um, in schools and any number of other areas today. So, um, can you've got the screen? You've got a a, a map sh um, up. This is uh, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, so I am uh, starting with this, but uh, these this map you're looking at is an example of more than 200 uh, maps that were produced um, by a federal agency in the 1930s. The federal agency uh, was the Homeowners Loan Corporation. Um, I won't, uh, I won't uh, get into the, uh, the wonky details of that, uh, that agency, but suffice it to say that in the latter half of the 1930s, between 1935 and 1940, um, they conducted this very uh, ambitious data analysis project to uh, grade neighborhoods and cities across the country. They ended up doing this for uh, more than 200 American cities. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, assign grades to areas on a uh, A to D uh, scale where, um, and this was meant to be both guidance for other agencies in the federal government, the Federal Housing Administration in particular, when it was making decisions about who, um, who received uh, mortgage guarantees and uh, provide both a method and maybe some direct guidance to private lenders, to banks, uh, uh, when they were making mortgage decisions. So that A to B scale, that for A, they um, the terms they use, they say these are the best areas. And they, um, they recommended that uh, responsible conservative lenders who were interested in their own profits and also this uh, larger um, larger uh, stability of the real estate market, uh, that those would be areas where it's not really problematic for, uh, for uh, people to, um, uh, to, for banks to make loans. Bs were uh, still desirable and they suggested like, don't make maybe an 80% loan, maybe make a 65% uh, loan on, on, the, on the principal of the, of the house. Uh, Cs uh, were, they, they described these as definitely declining. Um, and suggested that uh, the responsible lenders uh, really uh, really make sure they don't have too much risk, risk exposure in terms of mortgages in these areas. And then D, they deem these areas hazardous. And they said like a good mortgage lender is not gonna, gonna, gonna provide a, a mortgage in this area because uh, it's, well, that, that mortgage is, is a hazard. That's, that's too much risk. Um, and then they produced maps that reflected this. So uh, the colors were A, green, uh, B, blue, C, yellow, and D, red. That's the term redlining. And you can think of this like, the, the example I often use is like, a, uh, think of an early, uh, well, or a 21st century or an early 20th century uh, stoplight. Green means go. That's the kind of quick uh, guidance to a, a lender or, or a federal agency. C, yellow, means exercise caution and maybe stop. And D means, uh, red means definitely stop. So this had really um, a significant impact uh, upon, um, you know, where uh, private and public investments uh, went to. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Okay, so this is just, uh, you can't probably can't read this and I'll, I'll zoom in on a second. But what they did is they, they at, work with mostly realtors and they had them fill out a form. Um, and that uh, was used as a basis for determining that final grade. And, and this one we're looking at is a B uh, neighborhood in uh, on the south side of Richmond. 
Um, and can we zoom in, uh, do, go to the next slide, which will be a zoom in on this. I want to draw your attention to one particular part of this. So they were really interested and wanted to know who lived there. It's not just about the houses. It's not just about the amenities. It was about uh, the people that lived there. And um, particularly, I want to draw your attention to 5E, infiltration of, because they were, and you can even tell that language, right? They were um, viewing certain people um, from certain ethnicities and certain races as uh, as threats to the, st the stable uh, values and, and thus the um, profitability, uh, the in investability of certain areas. Um, so the two particular uh, groups that they drew their attention to is uh, 5C foreign born. They wanted to know if there were immigrants in the neighborhood and 5D Negro. They wanted to know if there are African-Americans in that neighborhood. And in this case, it's the B neighborhood and it had uh, no uh, foreign born uh, minimal immigrants or none. And they say for African Americans, they say no, restricted against Negro, and that's um, a um, and it, that's a plus for them, right? There's no African Americans in this neighborhood, and the restrictions refers to restricted covenants, saying that they had like private uh, uh, contractual mechanisms built into the deeds that prohibited owners from selling those properties, conveying those properties to someone who was not uh, white, uh, essentially. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so uh, this is just another example of how like how uh, baked in and racialized and racist these practices were. So what we're looking at here is the example of, uh, of 5D, all the answers for these for the city of Richmond. And, and I should say the city of Richmond is, um, this is, uh, there's a lot remarkable consistency, whether you look at a city in the north, you look at a city in the south, you look at a city in the midwest, or you look at a city of the west, you're going to see something very similar to this. Um, so in this case, you will see that uh, there is 0% uh, for any A, B, or C neighborhood, which means that, you know, each and every neighborhood that is given an A, B, or C neighborhood is white. And every African American neighborhood in the city, and you get a kind of sense of the, um, uh, you know, the pronounced segregation within the city, uh, just with the fact that these are so heavily African-American neighborhoods. With one exception, B11 has, is, a, is a white neighborhood, and there are a lots of poor white neighborhoods that are redlined, um, but this is an indication of how, um, how pronounced uh, the uh, segregation uh, and maintaining segregation was in making these grades, and how this, this both is reflective of and reinforcing of, uh, of segregation in mid 20th century America. And I wanna give you two more examples of this from Richmond. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Uh, so this is a, uh, a white neighborhood uh, that's given a C grade. This is Bird Park neighborhood in uh, Richmond. And I wanna draw your attention to the clarifying remark. Can you uh, advance to the next slide? So they uh, right. this area is yellow, largely because the school for white children is in the Negro area D, that's a neighborhood called Randolph. And because the Negroes of D8 pass back and forth for access to the William Bird Park, which lies to the west. For this reason, losses on property are being taken. Um, I was going to use this as an example, anyways, but I, I had forgotten there was a school. Um, it just uh, it slipped my mind that the school was so pronounced in this. But um, you get a kind of sense of how, uh, how, how uh, fixated and how uh, pervasive race and racism are in making these grades because this is not a, this is a white neighborhood and it's a, the proximity to a black neighborhood and it's the fact that uh, that you have black pedestrians walking through it and you have a, a school that's uh, in the in the African-American neighborhood uh, next to it just a couple of blocks away um, that the white children have to walk through a black neighborhood to get to their school and this um, is uh, deemed to be uh, something that compromises the value and the and the um, investability of these uh, these areas. And I'll give you one more example uh, from Richmond. Uh, can you advance to the next slide, please? So this is uh, a portion of a neighborhood, Ginter Park, um, up on the north side. That's highlighted there. Uh, next slide, please. And it's right next to a, uh, a African American neighborhood, uh, Washington, or what was an African American neighborhood is predominantly African American today, called Washington Park. And they say that these are respectable people, but two homes too near Negro area D2. So there's no difference between this uh, area and uh, the rest of the the neighborhood. This is uh, one uh, part of a neighborhood called Ginter Park, and most of Ginter Park was graded. Uh, be blue, um, but they cut out this chunk that 
adjoins and abuts uh, is uh, abounds an African American neighborhood, Washington Park, and uh, and deem this to be a risky area for investment. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I'm going to pivot and talk a little bit about schools. Um, so uh, this is uh, the map of Richmond you've we've been looking at. Um, and can you go to the next slide? And I just kind of threw, and this is this is very anecdotal, and I'll get to a little more data here. And I just kind of threw in like, what are the private schools in Richmond? Because Virginia underwent a process of uh, massive resistance in the um, in the 1950s after uh, after Brown, um, and uh, in the city there popped up as uh, as desegregation was implemented, a bunch of uh, private schools that uh, lots of white parents sent their children. I was kind of curious, like, I never really asked the actor the question, like, where are these and what relationship do they have to uh, to the redlining grades of the uh, 1930s? And can you throw up the next slide, please? So I just, this is a little hard to see. Um, and I don't think it's uh, a, uh, like a crystal clear, uh, answer that question, but it is does predominate in uh, a green line neighborhoods and b blue line neighborhoods, but not exclusively. There are there are a few in uh, in um, some uh, neighborhoods that were were redlined in the uh, 1930s, but it um, does definitely lean towards uh, the higher graded neighborhoods. Um, and I'll I'll pivot and talk a little bit more about um, more uh, uh, data around this issue. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? But before I get to that, I want to just uh, just throw up this slide and and again make the point that uh, I've been using Richmond as my example, but it's just one example. This happened everywhere. There's uh, you guys, a lot of you I know are from Texas, and there's ten uh, cities in Texas that have Hulk uh, Hulk maps, and these are all available on our website, Mapping Inequality, which I will throw the URL. Uh, into the chat, but uh, you can also just throw in mapping inequality into Google and it should be the first thing you see. Um, let me pivot and can you go to the next slide. I'm going to draw upon some work done by a couple of uh, Harvard researchers, Dylan Lukes and uh, Christopher Cleveland, who have taken our uh, rat mapping uh, inequality data set, our data set on redlining, and um, tried to explore the relationship and the correlations between it and um, and a number of factors in schools today. Um, and three in particular, I have three conclusions that I'm gonna highlight. You know, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, one is is that uh, schools in, uh, maybe not surprisingly, that, uh, that the uh, racial demography of schools today highly correlates with, um, with the red line, with the grades in the past. So A neighborhoods have a lot more white students are predominantly white. D neighborhoods are overwhelmingly African-American or, or uh, students of color with Bs and Cs somewhere between them. Uh, what I'm showing here on this uh, um, slide is uh, actually something uh, I think a little bit more interesting and surprising, which is uh, they use something called the Simpsons Diversity Index Score, which uh, is, I understand it is a score basically like if you selected two random um, students from a school, what are the chances that, that um, they're not going to be in the same racial or ethnic group? And uh, as you can see, like from this, that uh, A neighborhoods have the most chance, if you're, if you're in a school that is located today and that was located located in a neighborhood that was once green lined and given a red, I, I, excuse me, uh, given a, an A grade, um, there's uh, a far higher chance that there's gonna be some diversity in that school. And that declines for B and C and drops precipitously for D, which is kind of an indication of how hyper segregated uh, some of these schools, particularly in formerly red lined neighborhoods are where they're overwhelmingly uh, populated by uh, students of color uh, with, with very few uh, white students. So the, the, they're far more segregated than uh, some of the higher graded uh, uh, schools in higher graded areas. Um, next slide, please. Uh, a second uh, uh, second piece of uh, conclusion that they, uh, they have is that it's not a perfect uh, uh, line of decline, but that schools uh, in, uh, in A and B, higher graded neighborhoods, A and B, receive more funding uh, than schools in C and D. And this is perhaps no surprise because, uh, well, our, you know, our school funding is so tied to property taxes. So it makes sense that areas that have experienced, uh, you know, a century of, of disinvestment in residential um, 
real estate uh, have less of a tax base and uh, that produces less in uh, investment in schools. And um, I think about what I say there on the side is that actually the federal government and state governments both invest more money in uh, C schools uh, that uh, are located in areas that were related, uh, rated C and D, um, but that, is not remotely enough to offset the difference that local property taxes and district investment makes, which um, which means that yeah, that, that uh, on a per student basis, uh, schools in A and B neighborhoods just have a lot more resources uh, than those that uh, today are located in these historically divested neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. Okay, last one. Um, uh, Oh yeah, and then this correlates, not surprisingly, investment uh, correlates in uh, in the performance of students. And just looking at a couple of uh, standardized tests in English and math, um, scores drop and correlate very closely with the redlining grades uh, from 80 years ago. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, so I, I do wanna leave, I haven't left a lot of time. Um, uh, for questions, but if we, I do think we have a few minutes and I'd be happy to take them. Um, and again, I just want to, uh, leave you with the thought, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, proviso, the, the nuance that this is not like redlining causes. Um, but if we look at redlining is, I think of it as like the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's, uh, what we, a good data set we have to look at systemic racism more broadly in the 20th century and explore its consequences for today. Um, thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, since school boards are key, what are your ideas on single member districts versus at large districts? What does the data, uh, sorry, something else. Show, what does the data show works better? I actually don't have any expertise. Uh, I don't have any expertise on this. So I don't think I have uh, anything that I, an opinion that I'd offer because I, yeah, I just don't feel like I have the, um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I, I'm thinking about this as a parent more than anything. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't know if I have a, a good, uh, good answer to the question. So I'm going to, I'm going to punt on that. Um, okay. Uh, when someone starts a presentation by stating that there is systemic racism, it does not show anything to back it up. I have much difficulty. Also correlation is not causation. You're absolutely right. The correlation is not causation. And I wanted to, uh, emphasize that. Um, I will uh, disagree with you that, uh, I mean, admittedly, I'm only doing a 20 minute presentation, but I don't think you can look at this data set uh, from the early 20th century um, and not take this as a, a clear and straightforward example of systemic or structural racism. This is uh, is reflective of what happens in the happened in the private real estate market uh, for uh, at least two thirds of a century. And uh, more than that, it was the federal government in its regulatory capacity, um, putting its stamp of approval and advancing um, these racist ideas. So like, I, I mean, I just don't think that's absolutely, I think if you look at this and, uh, and not just take Richmond, but take any city and look at some of the, uh, some of the, uh, uh, so look at that evidence and look at the patterns that you're seeing this, um, the infiltration of uh, just being like a, a key example. Um, and uh, I just don't know how you can see anything other than uh, systemic racism. In that. Um, I know I'm probably over time. Uh, I, yes. uh, yeah, so great presentation, uh, Director Nelson. This was uh, very helpful uh, in setting some of the context of, of history. Um, even uh, within the work that we do at the Federal Reserve, uh, this history of redlining comes into play as we study economic outcomes today. And uh, you provided some, uh, some good context to help us see that connection into uh, uh, how education has been impacted by the, uh, by the, the redlining effort. So th thank you for that. And, and I do understand that your presentation will be available after the uh, the session, is that correct? That's totally cool with that. Yes, absolutely. All right, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we'll move on to our next session, uh, which is understanding inequality in virtual education and discussions on school choice. 
And so one of the things I want to make sure that uh, all of our presenters uh, know is that uh, my introductions are going to be brief uh, in order to ensure that we have as much time as possible for your presentations and uh, a question or two with the attendees. So I'm going to, uh, to hit them really quickly. Uh, detailed biographical information is available in the registration material that you received. And uh, I believe Anna also provided a link to the bio information in the, uh, in the chat. So with that, we'll start with our first of uh, four speakers who are going to uh, give us some, uh, some perspective on how virtual education uh, is creating equity or inequity, and also some discussions on school choice. And so we'll start with Colleen Dipple with Families Empowered. Colleen. Hi there. I hope, uh, can everyone see me? Great. Yes. Hi, hello, how are you all? Um, I was gonna set my timer so that I, I, I was told very strict timing and I wanna make sure I'm respectful of, of that. So I'm, I'm just looking at my phone, I'm gonna set my timer. Uh, and I'm gonna start by saying uh, thanks for having me. I, I'm really glad to see uh, there are so many people um, in, here today. Um, so Families Empowered is a non-for-profit service organization um, based in, in Texas. Um, our vision is that all families will have access to schools that work for them, um, and them is the key, so that work for parents and kids. Um, we provide free service to families. I'll give you a little bit of, a little bit of inf information about who those families are, but service means we connect families to schools and schools to families. So we're connecting literally thousands of families every year for free to school options. And so we um, provide um, families with information, uh, tools, services, and actually direct support. We have a bilingual call center that is free five days a week year round with the exception of like Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, but we are providing free services to families in Texas um, and for regions uh, like ur sort of urban regions. Um, and we've been doing that for over 10 years, just about 11 years. Um, our reach, uh, we serve over 105,000 parents, so we're adding families every day. Uh, they come to us through a bunch of mechanisms, but in the last year, it sort of exploded from families sending other families to us. And um, we are working in Houston metro area, uh, Central Texas, um, Bear County, which is San Antonio, um, and sort of some of the surrounding counties, um, and now in Fort Worth, uh, Tarrant County area. So uh, for folks in Texas, you'll know what I'm talking about. Anybody who's not from Texas, that's sort of, it's Houston, uh, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio, but that's not really, for those of us who are Texan, like an adequate way to describe our reach. So pretty big geographic reach. Um, and, and so just a little bit about the families we serve. Um, our families are uh, what I would say is majority minority families. 66% of the families we serve are Hispanic. The vast majority of those families prefer to engage with us in Spanish, which is their native um, language, first language. 24% of families we serve are Black, 3% uh, Asian, and 2% White. So um, we are also a majority female, majority minority um, run uh, led organization. Um, and, and so we're really in the business of serving. And as I said before, we connect families to schools and schools to families. We do not put a preference on one kind of, of family. Uh, I mean, what, sorry, one kind of school or one kind of family, but uh, one kind of school. So we work with district schools, traditional schools, magnet schools, uh, zone schools. We work with public charter schools. Um, and in Texas, we have a whole sort of diverse set of those kinds of schools, large CMOs, small and individual schools. Um, we work with actually with private schools, right? So we work with private schools largely that have scholarship um, money uh, for, for kids. So we work with a scholarships, cardinal scholarship. We work with religious schools, um, secular schools. And, um, and then we also have historically worked with homeschooling. And I'm just going to put that on, a, on like a side burner and say that, that that's not really our primary thrust. Um, but COVID has really... <laughs> 
given us a lot of insight into what parents want. But so our, our, we say our core customers are parents, right? We partner with schools in service to parents. We partner with all of those diverse schools. And um, we also have worked with historically virtual schools. Um, and again, that's a whole area where uh, we went from sort of it being, you know, um, not really um, a ton of demand for that um, before COVID to now just lots of <laughs> explosive demand. So we are a parent service organization. We are not a think tank. We are a do tank. We are service. We're in the service of parents. Parents are our core customers. We listen to parents. We also engage in survey work. Um, again, not for sort of research purposes always, although we have partnered with Columbia, um, the University of Southern California, and now we're working with the CDC to, to collect data that, for instruments that they um, you know, are, are using for research purposes, but we that is not what we do. Um, and I'm saying that all to say that we've been in the service of parents for a decade, so we have a lot of insight um, and experience, uh, but, but we are not like pushing out white papers and research, um, although we have supported others who do that. Um, we can do that because we, because we serve families for free. Um, and just one other note, um, six, so 60% of our families live on about $50,000 a year or less, and about 30% are living on $33,000 a year or less. So we, we are really focusing on a very specific set of families. Um, and, and, um, and those are folks who have historically been left out of um, sort of opportunities in education and some of the best schools, uh, quote unquote, that we have. And I think the redlining conversation gave you a little bit of um, insight into sort of the history of maybe how we got to where we are. Um, also, it's not obviously there's there's lots more to talk about there. So um, I want to just say before COVID, uh, there's there's sort of life. BC and like AC. Uh, BC is before COVID. So before COVID, we were serving thousands of parents, right? Which is still true. Um, most were really coming to us for district school options or charter school options. So we have massive wait lists for charter schools um, in the state of Texas. That's just verifiable. Um, and, and so they would come to us um, looking for options, maybe frustrated with their current option or out of transition year. Um, the things they were looking for, safety, um, responsiveness, right? These were the things that they cared about and then quality. Um, so after COVID, let's just say last year, we spent, we had a, a th 3 million person reach on our, um, like across all of our channels. So the, and we increased by many thousands of parents um, our data. So we also have a big data infrastructure, uh, which is how we know how many people we're serving. Uh, so lots of just demand for more choices and more options. Um, we recently did a pre-K survey along with children at risk and some other groups um, in, in um, Houston. We hoped in our micro surveys to get 3,000 response or 300 sorry responses parent responses we got 700 in the state of texas in 2000 it just sort of like got shared nationwide uh that's a pretty good sample size so we've got lots of engagement so after covid what we're seeing are sort of parents who normally would have just kind of like gone to their neighborhood school um just really engaged so that's a good thing i think that's a really positive thing um we're getting daily calls. Um, and, and so what we've learned is that parents want all options on the table. So before COVID, you know, as I said before, homeschooling and virtual schooling were very, um, you know, not really kind of stuff that we had a lot of demand, like interest in. Uh, we, you know, and, and very rarely would we be sort of directing people to Texas Homeschool Coalition. Last year, we had about 5,000 families who were like, I need help with this and I want to do this. Um, and it was our, mo we did a lot of Facebook lives. That was our most watched Facebook live. Uh, so, so, you know, honestly, two things. Uh, what we saw was massive demand for homeschooling um, and then lots of families choosing the virtual option. So in the state of Texas, schools were open five days a week for in-person and most had a virtual option that parents could opt into. Many, many of our parents, um, especially at the beginning of the year, chose our virtual option. Um, and many really wanted this year to go back, I think, to in-person. That was a lot of what our data told us. 
Um, and we know from our testing data uh, that probably in-person is really the best setting for most of our kids. Um, in the last few weeks, that's changed. We're getting calls every day about virtual schooling. So um, I just wanna be mindful of time. So let me just talk a little bit about school choice um, because it's a loaded word and I'm just gonna put that out there. We, we believe in and support funding following students um, to schools that their parents feel is best for them. And I, I know that that can be loaded and slightly controversial. Um, all of our work with parents over the last decade leads us to believe that this is really the most equitable path forward. And so the question really is why? Um, and by the way, we're not an advocacy group. We, we spend our time serving, but when asked, we answer honestly. Uh, so why? So one, no one group of parents are forced in a, in a situation where funding follows students um, into one model of schooling. Last year, COVID taught us more than ever before that we need multiple models for our diverse students. Um, more school options allows parents who are both taxpayers and we believe the most important stakeholders in the life of a child have power, autonomy, and options. Uh, it also helps to dial down some of these really intense curriculum debates. So we would like to see more culturally responsive schools, classical schools. There are some parents we've heard want zero tolerance. They want schools with very strict discipline. Some want schools. Um, okay, so I'm on. I'm on my. I'm on the like tail end of this. So that was my warning. Um, we want. We've heard some parents want uniforms. This masking thing has been really interesting. Some parents want masks. Some parents don't. Um, school choice, school options would give people the ability to find schools that are actually aligned with what they want. Um, it also creates more a greater local control because schools need to be responsive to constituents in their communities, um, and we think that would help. Um, we know that there are parents who feel trapped. We've spent 10 years listening to parents crying, parents looking. Uh, here are the reasons. Bullying curriculum is fed. Um, they have options. Um, if they're given some funding following their kids um, and COVID again illuminated this. So what do we think that means? Um, we need, we, we think that, you know, one, uh, here's what we would say. We, we feel, and so this is interesting because virtual, I was sorry, I was prepared to talk about school choice. So I'm, I'm not really, virtual options, I, I think what we would say is in the state of Texas, it was not so great, um, right? So 28% of black students in the state of Texas uh, fa passed, passed the algebra one exam. 28% passed last year. I mean that, you know, and the majority of kids who did better on our exams, and we can debate all day whether or not, you know, our, exams are flawed or whatever, um, but we're kids who were in person in school. Um, so that means one, uh, we need to improve, get as many kids back into school as possible. Uh, we've been engaging in a re-enroll Texas campaign that's focused on doing that, but it probably means that we also need to improve a virtual option. So we're hearing from parents that they want that on the table um, COVID has made uh, set up a situation where I think we can't put the genie back in the bottle where we're going to say to parents, like, you're not the most essential person <laughs> when, in fact, for 18 months, we've told our parents they are the primary caregiver. They are going to be responsible. We can't say to them, oh, no, just kidding. Um, and so our parents want all of these options on the table. Um, we think it is really important. Um, for districts, what does this mean, I guess, for our traditional districts is really the question to really embrace innovation, to embrace creating and developing multiple models, multiple pathways, um, including virtual pathways and improving those. Um, I think there's some, there's some chat, there's lots in the chat, general question. I'm, I'm gonna go on to questions. So I guess what I would say is, you know, in 10 years, what we've seen is not a decrease for school options and school choice. We've seen an increase. Um, there's lots of national polls. I'll put a few um, in the chat that support this. So this isn't just kind of like our, you know, our idea. If, if parents didn't want options, we wouldn't have over 100,000 families who we have their addresses, their phone numbers, their cell phone numbers. We've talked to them like we can verify them. 
uh, who would who looked for options. So the question is, how do we do that, and how do we do it in a high quality way? Um, Wendy, I don't know how many virtual schools there are in Texas. I think that's a really challenging question, uh, largely because the, the some again because of our funding mechanism. So we really haven't had an, the ability to create high lots of high quality options, um, and we've seen some of our quality options convert to charter. Lots of this again comes is tied to funding. So funding followed students. I think we would have better choices there. 28% of kids passed. Um, yeah, so Lori, I think there will probably be some later in the panel um, from, from U of H um, and from her who can talk through our STAR data. Um, Lori, that is Texas. Okay, thanks. Uh, Anna just answered that. Um, just do the homeschooling question. Okay, oh, sorry. I some of so let me just say a little bit, someone asked me about homeschooling. Homeschooling is fascinating. Homeschooling was on the rise. Um, actually, the fastest demographic of homeschooling um, growth in Texas before COVID was in the African-American community. And most people are like, what? Um, but if you go to the Texas Homeschool Coalition, you can, you can get their information on this. We had thousands of parents asking about homeschooling. We're supportive of homeschooling. If that's what a family wants to do, um, that's great. But homeschooling as your default because you're afraid to go into your school feels um, really rough. I mean, I'm an educator. I'm a, I'm a Texas certified teacher. I have a master's in ed leadership. I have two children. Uh, I, I would really have a hard time homeschooling. Um, so it really, homeschooling as an intentional plan, purposeful thing um, is, is really powerful for lots of kids and families. Homeschooling as your scared default option, I think is really concerning to me. And um, if parents are choosing that out of fear, uh, that, that's worrisome, right? So we, we should ask ourselves, so why, why is that a growing option, right? Um, and it might be because we are with we are not providing enough choice within our publicly funded system to give parents what they need. So, so why is it, I mean, we should be asking parents this, right? Like, why is it that um, prior to COVID, um, African-Americans in Texas were the fastest growing homeschool uh, population? Some of it has to do with a lack of culturally responsive teaching. Some of it has to do with suspension rates. So how can our schools actually provide schools that parents want and parents need? Um, I think it's possible. Like I'm not, I, I think we can do this, um, but we certainly, and again, I'm not a funding expert, um, but I'm not sure our data supports continuing to try to tweak and fix the system that was designed as we just heard with the prior um, speaker so many years ago for so many kids. Anyway, I, uh, who it is. Thanks, who's thanks who's Colleen. Failing. Colleen, yeah. thank you so much. You, you've given us some great, uh, <laughs> great food for thought as we continue with our program, uh, but we're, we're at time limit and need to transition uh, to Jennifer. Uh, so thank you so much again for your, uh, for, for your, uh, your thoughts, especially on the homeschooling topic. Uh, so next up on the panel is uh, Jennifer Miyake Trapp. Uh, she's assistant professor of education at Pepperdine University, and her primary interests are in culturally sustaining curriculum and instruction, uh, and also on learning technologies. And so, uh, Jennifer, we're, we're glad to have you with us. Hello, it's good morning for me, but probably an early good morning or good afternoon um, for my colleagues here in Texas and, and throughout the country. Um, so thank you so much for having me uh, today. I am delighted um, to be here with all of you. I am uh, going to talk to you a little bit about our Realtor Initiative program that we developed in the Pasadena Unified School District in uh, conjunction with the Pasadena Education Foundation and the Pasadena Education Network, as well as with our local Pasadena Foothills Realtor um, Association. So um, it's interesting, um, you know, the sort of lineup of speakers here and the diversity of topics, but 
through it all, um, you know, you see that common theme or that common thread of the need to really um, not only improve our schools, but make sure that the narrative about our schools is true and honest and accurate so that we can promote integration in our schools and make sure we're not um, resegregating them or perpetuating um, the de facto uh, segregation that has occurred um, historically. Um, so I am going to um, talk a little bit about uh, me personally and what brought me to this work and then share with all of you, I see there's 147 participants. So my goal is that each and every one of you might take away a nugget um, of a different way to innovate and to collaborate with um, unique community members and constituents that can help become advocates and voices of true and accurate information for our local schools. Um, and that perhaps this might be a model for um, any of you interested out there in creating those community partnerships to look at. So uh, when I first moved my family uh, to our area of Altadena, when we had the privilege of looking for houses, um, the realtor at a couple of the open houses said, this is a great community, but the schools. And so I heard a mention of redlining uh, in the past. And so perhaps redlining isn't officially legal now, um, but the redlining, de facto redlining, still occurs and is perpetuating um, school segregation. So I, of course, as a, a public school educator and my husband as a bilingual public school teacher, um, were really, really frustrated that we could go in and people would brag about the community and maybe unconsciously um, contribute to school segregation uh, in the community by saying you can't go to our public schools. Um, and realtors are often that first voice, that first point of contact with incoming families. And so when you remove our local schools as an option, uh, they don't have a chance um, to attract uh, all of the new folks that are moving into the community. Um, so that's really what brought me to this work. It's both personal, it's professional. My husband teaches in the local schools and my children attend these local schools and it's not lost on the students or the teachers or the staff that the larger community, um, the wealthier portions, especially the middle and upper class of the larger community have this narrative going on about our schools that they're not worthy um, investments uh, or not safe places for their own children to attend. So that's kind of what draws me personally and professionally to this work. Um, so I'll share a little bit of the context of Pasadena Unified, the historical context here. Um, so Pasadena had some of the highest performing uh, schools in the state uh, prior to 1970, uh, when uh, we were, I believe, the second school district to have court-ordered uh, mandatory busing um, to promote integration in the public schools. You know, this is the historical reality, the social and political context. When um, immediately following, in the years immediately following the the uh, mandated busing, um, there was white flight um, and families left the school district once the um, integration uh, was forced um, through the busing system. And so we saw an immediate disinvestment in our local schools. Um, and when those families, middle and upper class families, primarily white, left our schools, that also meant that there was community disinvestment. So it's not just, I often hear the dollars following the students. Students, it's all of the social capital and resources that are also associated with those, all the partnerships, all the connections to different organizations and industries and, and institutes of higher education. So it's not just the dollars that left the schools that are funded federally and by the state, but it's also those resources um, that often enrich um, a public school system and bring opportunity for all those who are enrolled in the public school system. Um, so our uh, 
uh, student population has decreased significantly um, and the white population, of course, have gone to other local schools, uh, school districts, I should say, um, or public, excuse me, public charters uh, and private schools. Uh, geographically, we have one of the highest concentration of uh, private and um, non-public and uh, charter school options uh, concentration in the country. Um, so there's a lot of competition here, uh, which makes it very difficult um, for our schools, our local public schools to compete. Um, you know, that is combined with, of course, um, you know, demographic factors, social, economic, and political factors, such as uh, declining birth rates, increasing property values, um, that are forcing many of our um, lower income students, um, our students of color to move out. Um, and also that's causing school closures. And so you end up with this really negative cycle. Um, you know, when families do choose to move into the district, they are bombarded with negative usually incorrect, inaccurate information uh, about our local schools. So with that being the historical context kind of of the trajectory of our schools um, and uh, in connection with redlining, um, what uh, a few of our local grassroots leaders decided to do was to pursue the real estate community as a way of changing that narrative, because there are so many amazing things happening in the Pasadena Unified School District we needed to break that cycle and get the word out. And it wasn't working just through our traditional channels, um, the news media generally, you know, it's, it becomes the Pygmalion effect, right? The self-fulfilling prophecy of, um, you know, let's just uh, put out another negative story. Um, so they looked at targeting the real estate community. And so um, I want to just to give homage to the shoulders that I stand on, which are Don O'Keefe, George Brumder, and Lorna Miller, um, who went out there and conducted an informal study of, real, of the real estate community, giving them a long questionnaire and one-on-one -on -one interviews about what information do you have uh, about our local school districts? What are some of those things that perceptions that you have and what information do you need? And from that data gathering, they uncovered so many myths about our school district, so many inaccurate perceptions. So we call it the perception gap about our schools um, and just a, a real lack of knowledge and up to date information uh, about our schools. And so from that, they collaborated with the Passing Education Foundation, the Passing Education Network, and the Passing of Foothills Association of Realtors to build the Realtor Initiative. Um, and this innovative program taps um, all of the local agencies that want to partner with us. And we actually have realtor liaisons in um, the local uh, real estate firms that uh, share information about our public schools, because we know the first thing that happens is people go to greatschools.org or dot, you know, whatever it is, and they look at these ratings and some schools are rated, many of our schools are rated very low, and that becomes the first um, point of decision making. Uh, we know that those test scores don't tell all the, st the stories of a school, that innovative teaching and programming and diversity um, and all of those rich things that make a school great aren't always captured in one number with a circle. Um, and so we really um, work to try to share accurate information with the realtors. They do, um, Passing Educational Foundation and Monica Lopez developed a newsletter that goes out to all of the local real estate agencies that's called um, Realtor Connect that shares positive information and stories um, with the realtor community. We also have um, Realtors Read Across Pasadena, which is an annual event that brings realtors to all of the campuses to engage with our teachers and our students and our administrators um, and various other informal and formal events. Most recently, what I'd like to share is our Realtor Certification Program. And this is the part where I got intimately involved. We started having um, uh, 
realtors uh, enroll in an actual certification program where they could become PUSD certified. So they would come to a workshop or several um, and learn uh, up-to-date information about our schools. What are our schools offering? Um, you know, what is the innovative programming that is available to families and students? What do our students look like? What do our teachers look like? What do they experience on a daily basis? What are those actual narratives that are true? And we bring them to a campus and then they tour a school um, and they walk through and see teaching in action, not a dog and pony show, but real life teaching in action with our real students. Um, and what we found is that they're blown away. They say, I've lived in Pasadena all of these years and all I've heard are these negative perceptions of the school and being here in this classroom counters all of that. Um, and so the realtors receive a, a digital badge that they can use uh, on their business cards, on their websites, in their uh, email signatures, and they're able to learn all of the resources and how to access those resources about our school system. So when they have a client that says, I'm moving to this area, they can say, have you thought about our public schools? here's who you should contact. Or when they're listing and having an open house, they can have the flyer there for the local public school down the street. Um, and this has really helped to change the perception gap. Um, we've even had um, you know, new partnerships with um, realtors and schools. So when a um, family uh, buys in a particular neighborhood, the realtor will donate you know, part of their commission to the local public school on behalf of that family that has moved in. So these partnerships are, you know, of course, changing the narrative of our schools, giving our schools a fighting chance, um, uh, and as well as becoming real community partners and financial um, bene uh, bene benefits to our schools. Um, I'll close with one um, kind of final anecdote about the power of this innovative partnership with our realtors. My husband teaches at a school that is consistently ranked um, one of the lowest in the area. It's also the school where my daughter attends. Um, and I happen to think it's, it's a phenomenal school. Um, that's why my baby is there. Um, when my husband was looking through ads on his phone on Redfin or Zillow or something and was scrolling through <laughs> pictures of a listing near his school. Um, and he saw a picture of the school in that listing. He immediately shared it with the staff and everybody was just so heartened. It was like, we've made it, we've made it. And so he called the realtor whose listing it was. And sure enough, she had attended one of our certification workshops. And now anybody who looks at that listing would say like, oh, what's that school? And all of a sudden we are part of the conversation. We are part of the narrative that our local public schools are exceptional um, and should and can be places where you can send your children, despite what you may be hearing in the media or in the news. Um, I see that we only have a couple minutes left, so I think I timed it right. Um, thank, so you, thank you so much, Dr. Miyake Trapp. Yes. Uh, we had one question in the, uh, in the chat, and it was, uh, how do you validate the effectiveness of the program? And I think you shared a, a great example there of actually uh, your husband following up and seeing uh, the placement and the picture of the school? Uh, are there other formal mechanisms that you use? Uh, and then uh, maybe you could give us just a little bit on how you help renters um, or does the program have any impact on the rental community? That's a great question, or both are great questions. So first, in terms of follow-up data, we do, haven't done any formal studies yet, um, but uh, there are uh, universities and researchers as well as other school districts who are looking at our program for models. So several other um, school districts nationally um, have been reaching out to us to say, how can we do this? We need to do this um, so that our local school districts have, um, you know, just a chance, a chance. 
um, to garner full public support because we do have all of those choices within our public schools for all the various types of programming that students and families might want. The second one is renters. That is that is a problem, unfortunately, that can't be ignored. That is beyond the scope of this particular um um, presentation. However, many of the realtors do represent rental um, renters, or they do uh, facilitate leases. And so what we want is when those rental exchanges are happening, um, to, for families to know that they should invest in our schools and that they should come to our schools, even if this is a temporary stop uh, on their journey. Um, and part of the work of the Pasadena Education Foundation is to look at justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so while this particular initiative is focused on realtors, we are focused uh, as a larger organization on ensuring that those furthest from the resources, those historically disenfranchised are being served in an equitable way that is culturally relevant and honors their lived experiences um, you know, in our school district. That is our commitment for sure. Thank you for that. And um, there are a couple of other questions that have come up uh, as we've uh, been, if you've been responding to the, the, the last two. And so if, if you would just take a moment uh, as we close here to uh, go and uh, respond to those online for our participants, that would really be, uh, be great. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Thank you. You're so welcome. And I just shared um, the contact information as well as a video about the Realtor Initiative and a website. So I'm not sure if that can be put into the public chat. That would be great. We will, we will take care of it. Thank you so much. And so next up is uh, Deb Delisle. Deb, did I pronounce that correctly? That was, that was super. Thank you. Yes, you did. Awesome. Awesome. Deb is president and CEO of the Alliance for uh, Excellent Education in Washington, D.C. And uh, Deb, the program is yours now. Uh, thank you so much. And if you could, uh, the slide can go up and just go to the next one. Next slide, please. Um, I just really want appreciate the opportunity to engage with everybody today on this critical issue. And um, I want to thank everybody, too, who's joined us, because um, this truly takes a village to resolve this issue. Um, you know, I, I put on this right now, maybe we live in interesting times. And I know that uh, this was a line that was spoken uh, just so many years ago, but it couldn't be more true about what we've been experiencing and are continuing to experience. Um, I know I live in DC and when the Delta variant started taking hold again, I was so filled with despair thinking of the hope that maybe some of us had earlier that we can start to resume um, some sense of regular routine, particularly for our kids. Um, but certainly the past year and a half, pushing two years has really placed us in a, a situation of uncertainty. Um, complexity and even challenges, right? Like those never seen before on such a large scale. Um, but additionally, we have to be reminded that it has shed an intense light on the, on the inherent inequities that exist in our education system. And I want to be very clear that uh, we all know that, that the pandemic did not create those inequities. However, it did bring them to the surface in ways that we can no longer ignore or sidestep. And it exact, actually has really exacerbated uh, the inequities that are existing within our education system. Uh, next slide, slide, please. I wanna talk and share with you a little bit. You can see there's a, a link to the exact report, but last May when people were trying to turn over to virtual learning in almost a 24, 48 hour period, there, were, there was a lot of data that was being released about the numbers of students who were connected and also those who had devices. And then the numbers were absolutely critical as schools struggled to turn to virtual learning, as I said, almost overnight. So as an organization at the Alliance for Excellent Education, we're now known as All for Ed, we questioned those numbers. We wanted to see about the accuracy of those numbers. So we conducted a study with other civil rights organizations to ascertain if the numbers were at least in the ballpark of accuracy. And you can find, you can find the results of the study, as I mentioned, on our website. Um, it was coined the homework gap by the FCC years earlier as they dealt with um, E-rate and other funding formulas that were designed to secure connectivity for all schools. I'm not sure that it is as accurate anymore. 
um, calling it the homework gap, but we know that these gaps exist. What we found is that the numbers were worse than what was originally shared last May by several groups. And you can see from this summary um, that students of color and students living in low income households were really not prepared to face a successful virtual learning environment. You can see the numbers of students um, who are lacking high speed home internet access that was all of a sudden necessary to support online learning to engage in it. Um, 7.3 million kids across our United States don't have a desktop, a laptop, or a tablet computer. And I want to be clear that what we were measuring here, we did not include smartphones because of the um, uh, uh, inability, if you will, of smartphones to actually engage in algebraic functions and writing, et cetera, it would just make it harder for kids. So we were measuring the desktop, the laptop, or the tablet computers, right? Um, you can see here that one in three Black, Latino, and American Indian, Alaska Native families don't have high-speed home internet. One in three families who earn less than $50,000 annually don't have high-speed home internet. And two in five families in rural areas don't have high speed home internet. And th those in the rural areas crossed over uh, racial as well as economic uh, lines. Next slide, please. I want to just let this sit there for a minute because so often what we found in our work, especially in our future ready schools work, is that when people in school districts who mean well, start to think about internet access and how can they successfully engage kids in, in, um, in online learning, what we often forget is that kids don't always have that access necessary. Um, I'm reminded of the old days, I'll date myself on this, with the, you know, the dial-up thing and it was just slow, et cetera, but kids who don't have access. Um, we're also limited by what I called uh, non-common sense schedules that were set up by schools. Um, and I have a very close friend who, uh, you know, she leads an organization, she has access to resources for her students, but she actually took a day off from work because she had a color code, a map and a calendar to understand when her student was a middle school student was going to be online or not online synchronous versus asynchronous learning. Because at one point, you know, on a Monday, the daughter had to be on at 932 and then on Tuesday it had to be 1011 and then on Wednesday it was very haphazard in her mind. So even at that when kids don't have the access, we also have to understand that sometimes our decisions and how we schedule kids have to make sense. Um, next slide please. What this slide also demonstrates is that, um, again, taking looking at that high speed internet access, whether or not they have it, these are the 10 states with the highest percentages of households without the high speed home internet access. You could see that they are predominantly in the South as well as in Alaska. Um, and the high speed um, internet access really refers to a, a wireline broadband fiber net subscription. So provided by way of uh, cable, fiber, digital subscription. Uh, next slide, please. So one in 10 families, this is 3.6 million families don't have a desktop, a laptop, or a tablet. And this includes 7.3 million children. So I just want that to sink in because that's really absolutely critical. Um, next slide, please. And this is the map again, primarily in uh, southern states, as well as a little bit in the southeastern United States. You can see that um, uh, these are households, 9.8% of households, including 7.3 million children don't have access to a computer. And what's really um, important to understand with this particular set of data is that we were only, me only measuring one device per household. So you can imagine how difficult it is with adults who may be in the family trying to get online to do their jobs, in addition to having more than even one or more children in the home trying to get on in schedules that were dictated by the school district itself. So we were only looking at one because that was the data that was accessible to us. We didn't even look to see how many had multiple devices because it was concerning enough that a district did not have um, just the one device per household. So next slide, please. You can see here uh, when we're talking about equity, students of color are less likely to have access to home internet service and computers than their white peers. And you can see there, we've broken this down by um, households and Latino households, black households, et cetera. 
that 4.7 million kids, including American Indian and Alaska Native families combined, lack the high-speed home internet service necessary to support online learning. So you can see actually that this homework gap is exacerbated by the fact that there's this a reliance or over-reliance, if you will, on having access and devices for kids. It's truly an equity issue. Next slide, please. One in three families, this goes into socioeconomics, one in three families, 4.6 million families who earn less than 50,000 annually do not have the high speed home internet necessary uh, for online learning. Next slide, please. What's really important here is that um, to look at the slide and it's, they're circled around with the um, emphasizes that household incomes really impact a student's ability to be successful when it comes to virtual learning. But how, well, however, and we place a yellow arrow on this, we should not assume that kids in higher income brackets are not impacted. Note that yellow line. We have even found that 15% uh, of households were earning 75,000 to $150,000. Uh, they're without high speed home internet access, 4% without a computer or a technical, technical device. Uh, greater than $150,000, even 8% of households without high-speed home internet access, 2% without. Now, we were not able to um, uh, understand the reasons behind that, and there are a whole host. We've had various focus groups on this. There are a whole host of reasons why, but I want to point this out to not assume, particularly if you are um, in a school district that's even upper middle class, um, lower upper class, if there is such a phenomena, that don't assume that everybody has the access that are necessary um, to be really successful with an internet access as well as a technological or virtual learning uh, program. I think that that's really critical. Ne uh, next slide, please. One of the things that I wanna share is that we simply can't waste an opportunity to transform our system of teaching and learning. One of the prior speakers talked about uh, the need to have a hybrid model approach. And I'm seeing that across the country now in all of our work that uh, kids, especially at the higher grade levels are really determined to find how they learn best. And they like a little bit of the, I'll use air quotes here, the freedom, if you will, to pick and choose when they're on class, what classes they're going to take online, what they would want to interact with somebody personally. So school districts really now need to look at how do you transform the system that was changed 16, 18 months ago into a system that meets many more kids' needs. And we're seeing a lot of school districts who are really looking at this hybrid model approach, who are looking at online classes that could support or complement or even supplant a class that's being taken um, to fit a kid's schedule, particularly if, if we find our kids are, are needing to work after school. So we have to ensure that we don't return to a pre-pandemic system, a system which left so many kids behind and didn't respect both the promise and potential uh, perils of online learning. We have to balance those out and we simply cannot go back to a pre-pandemic situation which caused great disparities in our system already. Next slide, please. Whenever I, uh, people will always ask me, so what is the role of an educator? I see it as being twofold. One is we have to prepare for kids for their future, not our present. And the reality is right now that kids are, are, you know, our system is set up to prepare kids for what we know or even for prior years. But what we know now is that kids are going to be changing. Current sixth graders are anticipated to change six times their careers, not um, different variations of their careers, but six times of their careers in their throughout their lifetime. So there, and many of them are going to be working virtually if they if we recognize the um, the role that the global economy is now playing. So no matter which place our kids are finding themselves in right now, we have to teach kids, we have to show them the way, and we have to facilitate their learning online so that if they become, um, and I'm sure the Shell Corporation deals with this a lot, where you have team members who are working across the country. I know my son is in an occupation which he has to cross over time zones and cultures in order to um, be productive in his job. So we have to help kids to figure that out. How do you make this connection? We have to figure out where our kids' needs are going to be. Um, next slide, please. 
these are just some high level thoughts as we lead our kids into their future. I won't go through all of them because time won't permit me, but we recognize that in a school district, principals at the building level are key levers of change, but a system simply cannot transform itself unless the superintendent supports them and sets the tone and the vision. I've walked into schools where teachers are willing to do incredible opportunities, provide, provide opportunities for kids, and yet either the principal or the superintendent through budget, through resources, through schedules, et cetera, they're not at that same place. So people have to come together in the community and decide what do we want our graduates to know and be able to do? What should they look like? But we also within that community have to have a deep willingness to ensure all students have opportunities that we want for our own children. In a prior role, I visited schools across the country. And I always walked into one, every single school I visited, I walked in with one question in my mind, is this school good enough for my own child? Because if the answer to that question is no, it shouldn't be good for anybody's kids. So we have to have this willingness to ensure that all kids have the opportunity that we want for our own children. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a little girl I saw many years ago. She's probably an adult by now, but every time I look at that face, I think she's counting on us. She's counting on us every single day to make the right decisions. Next slide, please. I mentioned that um, we, you know, I see twofold the, the, the whole throes of my work, as well as other educators across the country. And that is number one, to provide opportunities for kids we want, uh, that we want for our own children. And in providing those opportunities, make sure that we're preparing them for their future. And the second one is so important to me, which is to give kids hope every single day. Give kids hope every single day. America's youth are counting on us now than more than ever before. And you know what? They don't care if we're Republican or Democrat. They're relying on us to make the best decisions possible now. And again, offer them hope every single day. So I wanna thank you so much for your willingness to engage and even to resolve issues that are present in our educational system, because it's a time for all of us, individually and collectively, to be extraordinary. Let's just make a pledge to be extraordinary for all of our kids. Thanks a lot, Deb. Um, lots of comment, comments and discussion in the chat. Uh, one question that uh, I wanted to share is, um, uh, there's a question uh, from Karen North about the data and the uh, different types of digital devices. You shared a little bit about why you don't uh, consider handheld devices uh, in your in your tracking, maybe you can expand on that just a little bit. Yeah, it was not a tablets, which I consider a handheld device. So we didn't Sorry consider, that. yeah, that's that's okay, thank you. Um, we didn't consider smartphones. Um, that was included in prior, um, in a prior study that was done by other organizations. And what we were finding when we talked to educators is that uh, the smartphones actually were not capable, if you will, of doing some of the work that they now expected to be online. So we discounted those um, in, in, in a part of our study. Great, great. Yeah. And, then, and, and then lastly, um, are there any particular uh, success stories that you've seen that you think highlight this idea of where, um, uh, this uh, technology shared hybrid system should go going forward. Yeah, so we're actually following up on that. We'd love to actually connect in several months and, and provide an opportunities of, you know, sharing some of those success stories. But what we're finding across the country right now, particularly when you go online to allfored.org, we have a section called Future Ready Schools. And there are schools across the country, um, and we're collecting data even on Title I schools, for example, who are um, really planning out how to use the one-time monies that are going into school districts um, to make sure that every student has access to a, a technology device that can be used for uh, learning, whether it's a tablet or a laptop or whatever. And most importantly, the kinds of professional learning opportunities that have to occur so that educators um, not just grapple with the increased use of technology, but embrace it as well. And so there are a lot of schools now that are redesigning schedules. They're looking at ways to, even with dual enrollment and taking a community college course, for example, um, to also receive high school credit. So lots of data is available and uh, some of it is available actually on, online. 
Thank you very much. And, and thank you again for the great presentation. Uh, for those that have asked in the chat, yes, the, uh, the slides for this presentation will also be available uh, for participants after. Uh, Deb, we appreciate your, uh, your, your uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being a part of this important work. Okay, next up is uh, Mache Poor. Mache is Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for West Virginia University's Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Mache. I don't know if you all can hear me. Yes, we can. Awesome. Well, happy Monday, uh, Wednesday. You see how the week has gone, right? <laughs> happy Wednesday to everyone that is here. I am excited to be with you uh, today. And it's Misha Poor. Um, one of the things I, I, I am excited about is, you know, I know that all of our speakers prior to me coming have given you um, a plethora of information. They've given you data. Um, they've given you uh, 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 stories as to where we've been before, uh, where we'd like to go in the future. So now I want to kind of talk to your hearts of this work. And I will just say, first and foremost, thank you to the organizers that have done uh, a fabulous job of putting this information together for us, allowing us to be here. Um, but then I want to say thank you to all of you all that are participating. I know that we can go through a lot of things and, and talk to you, but we want to talk with you, not just at you, right? And I want to thank you for your passion. I know that whatever area of education you are in, it is because you have a passion for education. You have passion for children. You have passion for the system. Um, for someone who comes from a family of educators, aunts who were in this work aligned for 40 plus years doing this, um, that still are teaching, even though I have far since graduated, are still teaching me in the way that they did their classrooms uh, with the work that, you know, they have done. Um, and so I want to thank you. But I also want to talk to the heart of this work, right? We talk about sometimes the work and the policies can be hard, but it also requires us to do heart work. So that's heart work. And what that means is your perspective of how things are may be just that, your perspective. But in order to do this work well, you have to step outside of your perspective and take awareness of the classroom around you, your colleagues around you. What we've learned in regards to the pandemic is that virtual learning um, has worked for some, it also has been harmful for others. Not just because they don't have access to laptops or things of that nature. While that is important and that, of course, gets the information to them, and Deb spoke so elegantly about that, it also goes to them being home sometimes causes food insecurity, right? We talk about this is not new. It didn't just happen in 2020, 2021. It was happening prior to. Um, so going into the school systems allowed them to have access to the foods, uh, and I'm not talking to you in a way as though you don't know, but I'm doing it more so as a reminder as to if you've forgotten or if someone hasn't mentioned it or as you begin to plan for what is coming next, our future in education, how we couple these things all together to ensure that we are addressing the things that might now be new to some or uh, been known to others. So the food insecurity is something that I know that our students have been dealing with, grappling with. So whether it be, um, you know, WVU is our land grant institution. So we have a responsibility to the whole entire state of West Virginia. And honestly, we see ourselves as global ambassadors. So we don't just see ourselves as just taking care of West Virginia. We see ourselves as making sure we're addressing issues that the nation is dealing with. We're our one institution. So we do research around all the things that I've discussed with you or will be discussing with you. The other thing I think that is important is the mental health, the mental health of our students as well as our educators. And the reality is a lot of us don't want to talk about some of the things that this year itself has brought forth, right? The coping that we have had to do, the things in which we had to shift quickly as we've talked about, and we're still shifting, you know, just even in the course of the last couple of weeks, I'm sure some of you have shifted how you thought you were going to be entering into this school year and where you might be today and where you might need to go tomorrow. And so the first thing I would say is we're talking about this hard work is taking care of yourself first. 
in order for you to take care of others, you have to take care of yourself. And oftentimes when you come to gatherings like this, we don't always talk to you directly. We talk about the problem, the things and we have theories and we have all these things that play a part of it. But in order for us to really have the future of education that we want, we need you to be healthy and be partners in all this work. So make sure that you are paying attention to where you stand with this work, where you need to be. Do you need to step back and rest? Do you need to give yourself some breaks? Do you need to check on colleagues? Because we only are stronger if we're together. And the truth of the matter is, no matter where you fall in the conversation of choice, it is still we are stronger together as educators. Our kids need us, our families need us, and they're depending on us to figure this stuff out with them. Um, when I talk about coping skills, is you know our students they have also had to shift pretty quickly, and we know that to be true. But they're not going to always be able to say or tell us what they need directly. Um, and so, what are we doing in the process of to ensuring that we are talking with them, talking to them on their level, not talking at them? That we are asking them how they're doing with the virtual. How are they doing with coming to hybrid model? Um, asking them how their families are. Um, you know, I know we do this, and again, it seems very commonplace, but as we're trying to just do the order of business, as we're just trying to get our class curriculum done, sometimes we do not always pay attention to when someone is not okay. And then I think one of the things that we talked about, I know Deb spoke on this, and so I'm kind of like, you know, I don't want to repeat what she just said, because a lot of my slides or a lot of my comments were based on some of the inequalities that she talked about, is the broadband. All broadband is not equal, and we have to be very mindful of that, is that, you know, it, 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 you know some students don't have the devices that are necessary for them to be able to get the, the, the education that they are deserving of. Some of them don't have stable uh, hotspots or, or Wi-Fi access. And, and honestly, when we talk about the food, some of it is I'd rather have make sure my child is eating and we'll try to figure out how to sit in the parking lot of McDonald's to make sure that they can use the free Wi-Fi there. I mean, these are real things. And so uh, as we're talking about whether we be, should be uh, in the public school system or we should be at a choice school, the reality is, are we taking care of our students? Are we making sure we're leaning in? Are we making sure we're leaning into what the parents are speaking on in real terms, the whole of a person? We talk about the health of education, but even when I think about that, it's the whole of the person that we are also to be caring for and educating. Uh, we're ed they're educating us and we're educating them. It's not just us to them, right? And I think sometimes we forget that this is a, this is a collective system. It's a collective system. And when we begin to leave parents out, leave teachers out, leave districts out, and we begin to just only speak at them, then we've already lost um, some of the work that needs to be done. Um, the one thing that, that I, I, I wanna open it up for questions, I do wanna make sure we kind of go into deep discussion if able, and I know we have a short frame of time, but I do wanna talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion. I do this on a regular basis. Um, I do this every single day, and I am a believer of meeting people where they are. And I recognize as a proud African-American from Appalachia that everyone doesn't have my experience. I recognize and understand that I've been a member of a legislature. I'm a lawyer in my other world. I say that because I have so many different things I've been blessed with. And, and in that, in that, I am learning every single day how to ensure that we are talking about meaningful discussions. One of the things I will say is that my team did a poll of just school teachers and where they were with the conversation of diversity. And most of them were never taught this discussion, how to dive deep into this work, but most importantly, just how to answer some of the basic questions that students ask of them how to address parents in a way that doesn't cause them to feel as though well, I'm not equipped to have this discussion, so I'm just not going to address it at all. Um, and we want to make sure that that is not your reality. You know, when we talk about the hard work, it requires you to do some work. <laughs> and I hope that makes sense. You're going to have to find a book to read. You're going to have to find video and documentaries. You know, in 2020, a lot of people were allies of the work. And sometimes it was because you wanted to know and sometimes you felt it's what you had to do, right? Versus that you really were trying to learn for yourself. 
what I would ask you to do is take a self-reflection as you go throughout the rest of this year, this academic year. And when we talk about being teachers, we should be lifelong learners. When we are in education, that includes us too. We're not just in front of the classroom or making the policies and the rules and conditions for the classroom. We are here to be lifelong learners. And so as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it takes all of us, it will require all of us to stand together and work toward a more, the best of ourselves, to becoming the best of ourselves. So I wanna open it up for questions if anybody has any. I, I, hope, I don't know my time, so someone can tell me that. I hope I didn't go over. I was supposed to hit my button and I didn't, so. Misha, thank you very much. And um, you did not go over time. Uh, so you, we do have opportunity for a question if there's one from one of our participants. And as you are typing, I wanna say this, I wanna leave you with kind of a charge. And again, I am open for a lot of dialogue. Um, you are of course welcome to reach out to me and ask any question you may wanna ask privately. You know, I tell people that it's time for us to have courageous conversations. Oftentimes people say, oh, it's uncomfortable because I wasn't raised to see color. And what I wanna tell you is, you have to see people, right? And you have to see the fullness, the wholeness of that individual. And that means that that, whatever it might be, however they identify, because a lot of people have different ways in which they identify. It is seeing the fullness of that person, the wholeness of that person that allows you to be the best resource to them. And to ignore whatever that thing is that you are uncomfortable with, you need to be courageous learning how to get to that hard work, figuring out the things that you need to do. Um, one of the things I know people talk about is a Harvard implicit bias study. And I always tell people if there's somewhere to start, start there. Figure out the things that you need to work with. It's a private free study. You can click on anything. You can argue with it. It doesn't matter. It's not about agreeing. It's about learning about yourself first to figure out where you need to go in other areas. But I do thank you for your time today. I really hope that you have a beautiful academic year as you're going into this semester. And I know because of your commitment and your passion for our school boards, our education system, and, and, and all the other things that you will do well and that you will do some of the hard work that we've talked about today. Thanks, Misha. We really, really appreciate you uh, making this a national conference. Um, you know, our last two speakers have come to us from outside of the state of Texas. And uh, again, this is a great, uh, great learning. Um, just one quick question that of interest from my side. Um, you know, we talked about some of the challenges related to access to uh, devices and uh, broadband. Um, could you share a little bit about what you may have seen at the higher ed side sure. on students having similar challenges? Sure, I mean, you know, a lot, you know the libraries are, are, when you don't have income, you find the resources that you need to do and still be successful. And so when we went, of course, through COVID requiring things to kind of like we go quarantine, people could not use a library the way that they would normally use it. Some people had to travel home and so they didn't have the laptop access. So we were able to provide laptops to people. Some people didn't have internet. So hotspots were something that we had to purchase to ensure that they were able. I know a young man who was in a rural part of West Virginia who had to travel 30 minutes to sit in his girlfriend's driveway just to connect to some meetings that I was a part of asking him to be a part of. And mm. I didn't know that until and he's in law school. And so what I wanna say is that access is something that doesn't become available to people just because they graduate from high school. This is something that people have a lifelong need of. And so when we're helping them get out of K through 12, it goes into 20, you know, it goes into higher ed. Um, food, again, we kept our rack, we call it the rack. And so it's free food and vegetables in partnership with Kroger's. And they were able to still make sure that they had things that they needed for a healthy uh, time. And so we have to react and remember too that the way in people, and again, I know these are things that are commonplace for a lot of people, but the way in people's thinking is if they're fed. And I'm not just talking about food fed right? But it's talking about embracing, nurturing, and loving, pouring into our students, our colleagues, so that we can be fed collectively and stand together. That access is crucially important, but that access of information that you can research, that you can Google, it's okay to have a position, but it's unfortunate if you don't allow yourself to step outside of your personal perspective and grow and see what other perspectives are as well. You never know. You might even find your own perspective is different by someone else that has a similar perspective. So you might learn something else, another argument that you might have. So I hope that that's helpful. 
please feel free to reach out to me if anyone needs me. And I'm happy to have been a part of the day's discussion. Thank you, Misha. We really appreciate it. So that wraps up our second session on understanding the inequalities in virtual education. Uh, next, we'll be transitioning to our, our third session, which is a panel discussion led by our own Sharon Watkins. Sharon is head of uh, and is the director of the Texas Racial Equity Collaborative, which is a new initiative started uh, at Children at Risk. And um, Sharon, we thank you for being here because we know that uh, you, you have a son who is transitioning to college. So you should probably be somewhere either buying supplies or dropping off that young man and shedding a few tears. So we're glad to have you here leading this panel today. Thank you. Our son has been dropped off. Um, tears have been shed and, and now's the time for celebration. So this is really time and I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy to be here. We have such a stellar panel. I'm going to follow uh, Donald's lead and very briefly introduce them because we have a lot to unpack. Um, and this is going to be a, a robust and exciting um, discussion. So I want to introduce the panel, which includes Beverly Cross. Dr. Cross is holder of the Chair of Excellence College of Education at the University of Memphis. Uh, Randy Bowman, who's uh, founder and CEO of At Last Boarding Experience. Dr. Fred Bonner, Professor and Endowed Chair of the Educational Leadership and Counseling, uh, and Founding Executive Director of Minority Achievement Creativity and High Ability Center at Prairie View a and University. Arthur Mitchell is with us. He's direct, Executive Director of the STEM Equity Alliance. And uh, this is Victoria Franklin, who's a retired educator, SciFair and Houston ISD, who has been named Teacher of the Year in both districts. Um, so thank you very much for attending. Um, so as we talk about culturally responsive teaching and learning, um, I think it's important to, to point out that a number of us, including myself, had parents, aunts and uncles, older siblings who experienced both segregation and integration in the same childhood. Uh, and so while um, my relatives were able to um, identify that the segregated, segregated schools, of course, experienced in many cases, substandard or poorly funded materials, books and infrastructure, um, once they experienced integration, they found themselves um, missing what they, what they had in an all black environment, which was a nurturing that was geared to propel them to success and teachers who were invested in their success. Um, and you know, I know what it feels like to be you know, first and only in a place and um, experience the pitfalls of education that is not culturally responsive. So let's talk about what culturally responsive teaching and learning is and what it can do for students. Um, so first I want to ask Dr. Cross to help us to define culturally responsive teaching and learning. What does it mean? What is the importance of it? Thank you so much, so much, Darren. I appreciate this opportunity. Before I do that, I just wanna thank the organizers of this conference for recognizing that if we're gonna talk about resegregation, we must talk about culturally relevant teaching because it's an important, important part of it. And we must dismantle and disrupt the role that education as an institution plays in the resegregation of schools. We recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And one of the pieces that came out in the education sector was that schools are more segregated than they've ever been. So I really appreciate and thank Texas for doing this kind of work and making that linkages because we count on as a society, our schools to be segregated without question and that it's okay that they are segregated, they are resegregated and they're resegregated again. And that really gets a little challenge other than in a great conversation like the one we're having today. So I really want to, um, extend my appreciation for that so that we can dismantle the role of schools in, in this kind of work. So, so when glad you're here. I'm sorry. I said, I'm so glad to be here because I know this is an area that you are working on extensively. And so I really want to hear um, your definition of culturally responsive teaching and learning. So, you know, we've gone through the uh, multicultural education stage. We went through uh, the funds of knowledge stage of talking of the ways to frame this. We went through culturally relevant. We went from culturally relevant to culturally responsive. 
And today we're talking about culturally sustaining. So all of those different phases of ways to think about this work are important and have gotten us to the point that we have to ask, in what ways can schools um, acknowledge, affirm, and incorporate the identities, experiences, and assets of children, families, and their communities into the learning process? And, and to, to eliminate the process that we have, where we say to them frequently, welcome to school, we strip you of all of that because we see it as deficits and we don't want it to disrupt, interrupt or interfere with what we're trying to do in schooling. Culturally relevant and responsive says, instead, we need to be very cognizant of the children's culture and identity as an asset to their learning and as an asset to teaching so that we understand and use it as a base for developing them. Just imagine the beauty of when we incorporate the children's identity and help develop their identity through their academic experience. This is something white children have all the time because American education is designed to center their identities, to center their experiences. So their identities are an asset to their school learning. We need to do the same thing for all other children from marginalized groups and stop using the schools and the curriculum and the pedagogy as a way to marginalize and isolate them and turn it into a culturally relevant teaching, which means then that we have to think, we have to think more uh, sophisticated about incorporating identity development into teaching and learning. It often is not taught about at all because we believe that the content of schooling is benign, it's apolitical, it's ahistorical. We think it's just this um, untethered delivery of knowledge when in fact all knowledge is political, all knowledge is historical, all knowledge is affirming for some groups and disaffirming for other groups. So we have to take on how do we affirm children's identity and how do we incorporate it into the curriculum? We also have to think about how do we use the curriculum to dismantle inequality in our schools? How do we use culturally relevant teaching to dismantle inequalities in our schools? And all of our researchers and scholars who work in this area have identified multiple ways for us to do that. It is not an unknown. It might not be practiced in a way that has gotten us to the point we want to be, but it is not unknown. So they suggest to us that we do the following types of things, that we really focus on student achievement, we really focus on student identity, we really focus on students' opportunities to learn so that they don't feel like they are marginalized from the schooling experience, that we challenge any equities when we see them. I'm working with the school here, a charter school here, who is really working very hard this year to identify the ways in which inequities operate in schools in silent ways that no one takes on because they work in those kinds of ways. We have to validate and affirm children's identities and cultures, and we have to do that beyond the kind of um, simplistic way we think about culture. It really is about intersectionalities of identities and experiences and how that is important to the learning experience and how to use it as an, an asset to the learning experience. We really have to think about how do we take what we're supposed to teach and make it more transformative versus make it what we call the banking of education, just dumping it into children. How do they own it? How do they use it to their advantage and how they use it to transform their lives? Uh, Sharon, I could have a feeling you were telling me I'm at my time. <laughs> uh, and so I I'm- This follow up for you which is, and I know that this panel is, is, is not only just a, a panel of thinkers, but of doers. And so I know you're in the trenches of helping educators become culturally responsive. And so one tip that you would provide um, burgeoning um, educators. Yes, yes. It goes back to something that one of the other panelists said, and that is to think every day, what can I do to bridge what I teach to who my children are? and not to simplify and make uh, generalizations about they, who they are, who they authentically are. And how can I use their vast interest 
to intersect with my curriculum and what I'm teaching so that they say they can see that I've taken that extra road to really make those connections profound. And how, what is one thing I could do to um, uh, make the curriculum more transformative for them? Thank you so much, Dr. Cross. I think this is a good time to segue to uh, Dr. Bonner. Um, and my question for you is how, how can culturally responsive teaching address the racial inequities and disparities that have been laid bare or made worse by the pandemic that we're in? Awesome, excellent. And thanks for that great question. And I would say there are a number of um, entryways and entry points to uh, enter into this discussion. And um, I always say that I'm a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll in the sense that um, my uh, master's level training was in uh, P-12 education um, in curriculum and instruction. And my doctoral level training was in higher ed administration. And I truly think that when we start talking about equity and these having these conversations, we have to really look at the pipeline. So not just P-12, not just higher ed, we tend to bifurcate. So I would say to my students when I was teaching um, in my very first position, it was a P-12 position I taught in the um, Ed Leadership Program at Centenary College, a small private liberal arts college in Shreveport, Louisiana. And I would say to my students, what do you know about what's going on with those folks who are majoring in higher ed administration? Like, oh, Dr. Bonner, we don't care about that stuff. We don't deal with colleges and universities. I'm like, oh, so you're telling me that you're not concerned about where you're sending your students to? They're like, well, I said, you have to understand what's going on. You know, what's the conversation going on in higher ed about liberal arts curriculum? What's going on about general ed, uh, the general ed core? You know, what are some of the things that are being said about student financial aid and how that impacts academic achievement? You have to understand where you're sending your students to. But then I would have those same conversations with students in the higher ed program. I'm teaching at Prairie View in the doctoral program in higher ed. And prior to this, I was at Rutgers University and at uh, Texas A&M College Station. And I would always share with my students, I'm like, here you are in the College of Ed and you're studying higher ed administration and student affairs. What do you know about what's going on with the P-12 people? Oh, Dr. Bonner, we don't care about that stuff. We don't study uh, P-12 and K-12. We're not interested in elementary school or secondary school. We want to become deans. We want to become department heads. I'm like, oh, so you're not concerned about where your students came from. So you don't know what's going on with common core standards. You don't know anything about what's going on, what TA is saying about how students should approach education. You don't know anything about the fact that black males are underrepresented and gifted and talented education and that they're overrepresented in special education. Oh, so you're telling me you're not concerned about where your students came from? So I think to truly address these issues of um, uh, resegregation, equity, diversity, inclusion, you really have to start at a process of looking at the pipeline, not only what goes on in P-12, but you also have to look, on, look at what goes on in higher education as well. That's a bit of a, a, a component of um, the story I think we used to start, but actually when you boil it down, I think with teachers, we have to start with self. You have to first do a self-assessment before you can affect and impact what's going on with students in the schools. You have to first understand where you are and how you are, you have how you position yourself to understand about these students of color, about all students, about students in general, but about students of color in particular. So one of my uh, favorite theorists is my uh, good fraternity brother and friend, Dr. Gilman Whiting. He has his model is called the scholar identity model. And Whiting says that before you can get uh, these students, particularly these black male students, and we both study high achieving black males, academically gifted black males, before you can get them to first see themselves as um, being successful, you got to get them to see themselves as scholars. But before you start that, you've got to believe that they can be scholars. So for teachers, for these schools, for administrators, I say first start with self. You know, one of the courses that I teach in the doctoral program is qualitative research. And, and we talk a lot about perspective and positionality. And there are two different positionalities. There is the outside or outside perspective, and that's what's called the edict perspective. So if I'm an African-American male and I'm researching, I'm studying African-American females, I'm always going to have the edict perspective. I'm an outsider. But then I'm an African-American male and my primary research focuses on academically gifted and talented Black males, particularly in STEM. So given my background in, um, in education, given my undergrad degree in chemistry, having gone through public high schools in Texas, so I have some under, understanding about the population that I'm studying because I bring what's called the emic perspective. So I think that 
as we look at trying to affect change for these schools, particularly for what our teachers are doing, and we know in our country that the school systems are very, very much black and brown, but the teaching forces are very much white and female. So right there from the very beginning, and I'm not saying that if you're a white female, you can't relate to black and brown children. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that these teachers are bringing an edict perspective and they're trying to understand what's going on with their students who are having these emic perspectives or who have a different perspective than them. So I think we must start with self. We must look at the pipeline. And that's where I think we should begin this conversation about how we really truly look at dismantling some of these things we're talking about. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonner. Um, I, I want to now give an, an educator an opportunity to speak, uh, um, uh, Victoria Franklin, who is a former uh, educator in both um, Sci-Fair ISD and Houston ISD. And uh, I, I know as a former teacher that a lot of what we learn in academia, we have to actually put to the side when it comes to actual classroom teaching. And so my question to you is, um, you know, what would you like to have, have known, like really known when you were a brand new teacher and about culturally responsive teaching? And do you have any examples of how you adjusted teaching strategies beyond what you learned um, when you became a teacher to meet the needs of your students? Hello, I'm really excited about this opportunity that I'm having right now to be with you guys. Um, primarily, yeah, when, when I was asked to do this, I was trying to figure out exactly what direction I would wanna go in. And I, I decided that um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was that I grew up in inner city Philadelphia, but I went to school in rural Pennsylvania. And in my one of my first classes, um, the, uh, the instructor wanted us to talk about uh, teaching inner city students in their dialect, that they were supposed to write that way, that they were supposed to be able to speak that way. And apparently she did not do um, her studying because if she knew that I was from inner city Philadelphia, she realized I speak just like I do now. Therefore, I felt that that was a way of keeping kids back. Now, of course, most college students would be quiet, but that was not my perspective. Um, so I did speak up and I indicated to her that I felt that that was a way of keeping our children back and that I would not accept that. And well, needless to say, my grade didn't turn out that well, but that was okay um, because um, what I did was I definitely just went ahead and that solidified my interest in teaching. I love teaching from the day I started teaching to the day I ended. Okay, but one thing that I did realize is when I got into the schools that there were not people who look like me in those schools teaching our children. So, of course, once I got into Sci Fair, I went to my principal and I said, some things are subliminal. If kids see people who look like them and they see people who are successful, then they will model that type of behavior. So as time went on, we did have um, more teachers that um, reflected the, uh, the actual school population. Now, what I, when we first started, and I think um, that uh, there was a mention of uh, multiculturalism. Um, when we first started, that was one of the things that we had talked about, you know, making sure, but it was all in isolation. It was, you know, you had the black history boards and then you had the Hispanic history boards and, what I realized is that it was all in isolation and history is history. So why are we not going to include this population in history? So my environment started looking like the children that I taught. So, you know, the books I had, the music I played, uh, the poetry we used, the posters that were in the room. And that really helped for them to feel included. Um, there are just several things I want to touch on before my time is up. But one of the things, I'm just gonna give you a list basically. Learn how to pronounce your children's names. I found that kids tried to create um, names that they felt that we would understand and they'll call a nickname. We need to make sure they understand your name is important. That's part of your heritage. Get to know the kids and their families. Let them talk every once in a while. I mean, sit down with them at lunch and talk with them about their families and see what's going on with those families. Um, like I said, your classroom should re reflect 
children will rise to whatever occasion you have them rise to, okay? We need to make sure our children strive for excellence and don't accept anything less. If they believe you believe, they're gonna work hard and they're gonna keep pushing and they're gonna do what is needed. Um, my biggest educational opportunity came from raising three sons in the educational system. I learned a lot from them. I learned about, and they were all in different um, educational situations, okay? So I had my one who learned to read at two, and then I had the athlete who everybody just wanted to push into, you know, I, you know and I said, yeah, well, you, you can be an athlete, but you're going to college. And then I had, you know, my youngest who had a few struggles, but he did exceptionally well too, and is now a pastor. So I remember, um, just getting in there as a parent as well as an educator. And that made me the best teacher I could be. Um, and before I leave you guys, I just wanna to talk to you about, um, remember the environment of cultural responsive teaching is for all students, not just the children of color. Anybody who is exposed to this type of teaching and multiculturalism and knowing about other cultures will take these experiences and they'll take it and, um, and they'll carry these experiences all through to their adulthood. That's it for me. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll hope I have a chance to circle back. Now I wanna get into, um, it, it, takes a, it takes a village of course to raise children. We, we've all heard it and familiar with that, but it also takes a village of ideas and solutions. And so I want to go to Randy Bowman to talk about his idea and his solution, um, which is at last boarding experience in Oak Cliff. And so I want to ask you, Randy, what was the impetus for starting a boarding experience in Oak Cliff? And how is culturally responsive learning um, baked into the cake of this idea? So Sharon, thanks first for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank Dr. Bonner for talking about the manufacturing process that leads kids to college. I think that's really important. And I love teachers. So I'm always happy to hear from educators. They've been heroes in my life. So uh, the impetus for starting this, I really had two motivations, one visceral and the other sort of analytical. And so with the visceral one, it was to honor my mom. My mom is a hero in my life. She raised the four of us in a very impoverished part of Dallas. It was a struggle for that sister. It was always really hard. She never seemed to get a break. And the bottom line is this, she would always say, I just wish I could give you all what those folks across town who have more money are able to give their children. And what she was really referencing with that was not necessarily material things, although she would have taken that too. It was really about the quality of education and opportunity that they were able to give their kids because she wanted most for us to have a good adult life. And so I figured the best way for me to honor her sacrifice was for me to try and enable other mothers who are in the same position that she's that she was in to be able to give their kids today what some of us are able to give ours. So that's the visceral reason. Here's the analytical reason. For as long as anybody who's watching this podcast, I'm sorry, this panel has been alive, the truth has been that the kids who perform best in schools are those who come out of households that have the most resources the resources to enable learning to continue for them once they've left the 29% of the day that they send at school, spend at school and they're into the 71% of the day that they spend at home. That created a question for me. Analytically, if the kids who perform best are those who have the most resources during the home life hours, then the question becomes how would impoverished kids perform if you gave them the benefit of a home life infused with the resources that those who are more fluent have? at last exist to answer that question. Repeat your second question for me. I, I wanna make sure I get it framed right. No problem. And you're, you're actually just right there on the cusp of answering it. <laughs> and that is how is culturally responsive learning baked into what um, at last offers your students and residents? And you might wanna just provide a little, a little uh, detail about how at last um, is working for children in Dallas. Okay, I, I'm happy to say it's working really well. We had our first uh, semester of operations last semester and the kids with the deepest deficits improved their performance in their core classes by 21%, as in their grades in their core classes improved 21%. And during the time when we're hearing from everyone from the ISDs to the privates to the charters 
and from the TEA that they don't know how they're going to accelerate the catch up for those kids. We feel pretty good about that. Now we're still vigilant and we know that we still have to work every day to earn those outcomes, but it's working pretty well so far. And our basic premise is this, we improve the performance of kids during the seven hours a day that they spend at school by focusing on the resources that we make available to them during the 17 hours a day that they are not in school. We do not replicate what teachers and principals do during the school day because we are incapable of doing that. What we replicate is what well-resourced parents would put into that child's life during the 17 hours a day that that child is at home. That we know how to do. And then we look for good principals and teachers um, to partner with us as we engage in that effort. But our clients are the children and the families they come from. That's amazing. Um, what do you think is the future of At Last now that, now that you have a, a model that is working? Um, and so just, just to clarify for those that are listening, At Last is not a school, but it is a boarding experience. So you're, you're totally focused on what happens outside of school. That's correct. And I feel like I should at least honor the topic of the panel and talk about sort of how it is that we infuse uh, cultural relevance into what it is that we do. And I think that's about the design and so it's, it's about the design of the solution and the perspective of the person who created it. And I tell folks that I'm solving a problem that I lived, right? And life experience is a useful teacher and a useful reference. So in creating at last, you know, I, I ask myself, what would likely shape the culture of those that we are seeking to serve, those who we are trying to enter the over in Pleasant Grove in Dallas? And culture was forged at the intersection of race and class. That, that was the main input into sort of how our culture unfolded and our families were obviously the biggest players in it. So every process step involved in the at last solution, every one of them was created through the lens of given the culture that we are serving and the outcomes that we are seeking, would this approach be effective? And if it wouldn't be effective given the culture that we were serving, then it was extracted and I didn't include it in the solution. It would become eliminated or it would become modified. Because again, I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem for a certain group of folks. And why would I fashion something that doesn't speak to their culture? It sounds to me like an approach that wouldn't work. So we didn't, uh, we didn't take that approach. That's how we've tried to bake culture into what it is that we do and respect for the culture of the folks that we are serving. And so now I want to go to the question you actually asked me. Tell me what that was. I'm sorry. <laughs> you just answered it, which was how was, how was culturally um, responsive learning baked in? Oh, I mean, the one that you asked me about the future, the future of that oh, class. Yes. Okay, so the future of that last is about, like, I'm a business guy. So I believe in building models that can scale and replicate success. Because if we don't have critical mass, I'm not going to be able to impact the outcome of public education. And you know, we're agnostic on where it is that kids go to school, but the bottom line is that I think about impoverished kids. And if I can't scale this, then we can't have the impact that we want. So we're gonna prove up our premise at this location that we have in Dallas, which is right across from South Oak Cliff High School. And we have room for 180 scholars and residents on the initial site that we have, but I believe in testing it out on a smaller scale to prove up the premise and then scaling out. So we have the capacity to serve 16 scholars and residents in the house that we have built. Houses two and three will get us up to the 180. We're in conversations with other cities around the state and really with sort of business and policy and education leaders in those cities about scaling the model and bringing it into their cities. And so what I envision is proving up the model here, scaling it through Dallas and scaling it around Texas uh, where we find good sponsors and good partners. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, sure. I wanna pivot to talk about uh, STEM education um, with uh, Arthur Mitchell. Um, and I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the cultural barriers to STEM careers um, and how does your organization tear down those barriers and help to improve the pipeline of uh, black and brown students to STEM careers? Well, uh, thank, first of all, I wanna thank you for having me on this panel. Uh, I was looking at myself and the, uh, you know, how I fit into this group. I'm, I'm glad I kind of get to bring it home because there's something that's really important, authentic about STEM that uh, bridges all of this. And um, as a lifelong educator, um, 
you know, all these discussions around what this means from a K-12 to uh, extending it to the higher ed and graduate school, uh, and then bringing it back full circle and how we bring those folks back into classrooms uh, and how STEM is really important in that and kind of a, an odd fit or a quiet discussion that needs to be amplified. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm Texas by roots. My mother's from Texas, even though I'm up here in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, so I, I have this uh, affection for the state, uh, even though it's too hot for me to live down there. Um, so I, I think one of the big things is, um, you know, when we say STEM, uh, people want to, it, it's taken on life of its own, uh, and it's taken on its own set of definitions that don't necessarily fit the, uh, the roots. You know, STEM is actually science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, which is still very siloed in its perspectives. Um, we think of STEM and it's been used as a term that is kind of a catch-all now. And maybe even in some cases, uh, we have what we call STEM courses or a STEM curriculum, but it's still operationalized as a science course or a math course. Uh, the places that are fortunate enough to have technology and engineering courses, um, you know, you're, you're not gonna go out and get a STEM job for the most part. Uh, if you're teaching, you're probably not gonna get a STEM certification, you're still going to get a, a, an original legacy core certification. So, you know, we have to put that into context. And, but, but when we're looking at the STEM career fields um, and we have to think about whether or not STEM um, in, in that respect believes that there is a problem, do they recognize that there is a problem? Um, is the lack of diversity in STEM careers, the brokenness of the pipeline or the, the uh, that going towards STEM careers, um, is that seen as uh, an issue that the industries or that the academy actually want to address at this point? Um, we, we, you know, through some of the work with Shell, with the Smithsonian Science Education Center uh, over the past few years, there's been a STEM teacher diversity conference, STEM teacher diversity summit. Uh, when we've talked about the issues of getting black and brown STEM teachers in classrooms, right? Uh, which is great. It's a fantastic conversation. We have lots of conversations around the country around uh, diversifying the educator population. Um, but that feedstock has to come from somewhere. And where's that feedstock of STEM teachers actually coming from? Uh, we have to start at that K-12 level and determine whether or not uh, we really believe that students have the right and the uh, ability to pursue STEM careers, and that is by and large determined by the barriers at the K-12 level. Uh, when we think about what is actually offered, you know, so state graduation requirements, um, most states will still have four years of uh, English on the books, possibly four years of social studies, but then two nondescript years of math and science. So if your basic requirements are the minimum, uh, and, that, and that minimum is not going to prepare you for uh, or allow you to aggressively pursue STEM careers, then it's really that roadblock at the K-12 level. Um, you know, so for our organization, the STEM Equity Alliance, we, we believe that uh, access to a high quality STEM education is a right and not a privilege, but it's most often treated as a privilege and not a right. You know, when we think about all the careers, when the students enter kindergarten, so we have all careers A through Z for black and brown children because of the systems they belong to. By the time they get to eighth grade, they're usually down to like A through K, right? And then students who graduate now, they're down to A through G is actual careers they can go into that are involving STEM. And so it really is broadening um, the, the engagement for 12 years of engagement that allows students to make a choice. I'm not saying that everyone has to go into a STEM career but the system shouldn't dictate whether or not they are, have a choice to go into those STEM careers. So the, the cultural barriers, when you're saying cultural barriers, um, you know, are we saying that STEM, there is a culture of STEM? There, there certainly is, it's a culture of what we believe and who we believe uh, should be in STEM careers. Is there a culture of STEM at the higher ed level? There, there certainly is. And once again, it is who we support in those areas, who's getting the mentorship, who's getting the opportunities and whether or not um, there is a, uh, an idea that students who are diverse students, students who are especially uh, black and brown, uh, you know, African-American, Latinx students uh, should be in those places and are supported in those places. And then bringing this back around, um, what does it mean for uh, creating a feedback loop that's going into these schools? Because once again, we can't get more 
diverse STEM educators until we have a broader set of students going in from who we can then turn around and go back into STEM careers. So it, it, it's, a, it's a very complicated issue, but what we do with STEM really dictates what happens with the rest of the system. Math is still the limiting factor. So if students are not getting access to a high level engaging math curriculum, chances are they're not going to be able not just to go into STEM careers, but they're not going to go into higher ed or be eligible to go into higher ed at all. That very early on, their choices start being limited. So it's really how do we think about the STEM enterprise, you know, pretty much as a canary in the, in the mind around what's actually available to uh, students as they're going through the systems. You know, so for, for what we do at the STEM Equity Alliance, we really do work on that broadening, you know, there's this metaphor that had been put out maybe you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, around this leaky pipeline. And it was describing all of science careers. Um, and, and it showed how if all students entered, we were getting this drip at the end of the pipeline of students coming out going to STEM careers, saying that there was a crisis in the United States. Well, if we take that metaphor and extend it out and take a look at what's happening with black and brown children, we're, we're not even getting the drips coming out that are necessary to be sustaining for any community. And, and so it is, how do we uh, affirm that those students have the right in, in, to have this type of education? Because it is through the STEM education, the innovation economy, uh, that we will continue to support and develop black and brown communities as well, because STEM careers are high paying careers. I know you you look like you're trying to get in here somewhere at you no know, edgewise. <laughs> I want to I uh, give you a follow up from our, our chat box. And as we close out, I have a question for you. And then I have, a, there's a question in chat for Randy Bowman. But my, the question for you is, what percentage of STEM uh, careers are computer science? Um, and I want to also encourage our panelists, if there are websites or resources that you want to share, to please drop, drop those in the chat. And so I'll give you, give you, give you a direct that. Um, I, I don't know the percentage, but computer science or computer literacy coding it's important and increasingly important for more and more careers. One of the really interesting things is that computer science actually goes across computer science, engineering, and business. So actually getting to the core of that number is a little bit difficult, but we actually have a greater number of people of color in that tech space, in the computer science space, than we have coming through in engineering or in the pure sciences. So computer science is actually open and growing, but we're still underperforming and underrepresented there. And but not as much as we are in engineering or as we are in the pure sciences. Thank you so much. That's uh, really riveting um, information. And, um, you know, STEM is the gateway for a, a lot of success for our students. And I want to add as a parent of uh, someone who's also in the arts that we're talking a lot about adding the letter A um, STEAM. And, and calling it STEAM. Yeah, that design. There you go. So, so yeah, I just want to acknowledge that. Um, uh, Randy Bowman, as we close, we have a question in the chat for a few examples of what well-resourced parents do that you're replicating it at last boarding experience. Okay, it's a, it's a great question. And so we start with the notion that at last serves elementary school age kids. So in our first cohort, we're talking third, fourth and fifth graders. That's sort of the meat of what we do. And here's what we're resource parents do when the kids are at home. And I don't think this will wind up being a mystery to many. Uh, you start with the basics. And I'm not commenting on anyone's household or community other than my own and growing up and those who have come to us. But well resource parents provide stability in housing. You know, you're not uh, housing insecure every month. They provide uh, food and meals available reliably and uh, healthy. But when I'm speaking of healthy, I'm not speaking of healthy maybe in the general application, but simply the notion that the food has not gone bad yet. So food and meals reliably available, utilities without disruption. This really is sort of fundamental stuff where you don't have the ingredients you need to learn if you don't have them. Clean clothing daily. Because a lot of times you wind up with discord with your peers because they are commenting on your appearance. And it is a, it's a tough thing. So those are just sort of some of the basics, all of which apply to every kid who's in our program and all of which I have uh, personal familiarity with from my own journey. The other thing beyond the basics though is this, 
an engaged advocate with the school every day. Every educator I've spoken with has said, I feel like we do a really good job with these kids during the day, but when they get home, it's a challenge and I don't have an engaged parent that I can talk to to help their child work through their issue. Now, I'm not Pollyanna about this. Sometimes that's because the parent has to work. Other times it's because the, fam the parent is unavailable for other reasons. And I do this without judgment. So one way or another, we are there to provide an engaged advocate uh, for that kid at that school, liaison and advocate. The other thing is, or another thing under this umbrella is uh, developing kids into proficient learners by helping them to sort of deconstruct how it is that you learn math, how it is that you learn language arts and reading. And we don't do that as teachers. We do that the way that a parent would do or a tutor might do for a more well-resourced family when a kid comes home from school and isn't thriving in math and someone has to help him or her to figure out this math operation. Well, it's the kind of thing that probably happens in a lot of uh, well-resourced households, but it doesn't happen in the community that we are trying to service. And that's not just my perspective, that's the perspective of the teachers and principals that I visit with, and also funding the exploration of extracurricular interests. And I realize that kids don't simply want to learn that which we want them to learn. Sometimes we have to awaken their intellectual curiosity by allowing them to explore an instrument or coding or even sports. If, if they're interested in something, my mother's response was, if you wanna learn how to play a piano, that sounds great, sweetie. Where are we gonna get a piano? Where are we gonna get some lessons? Well, if your child is in at last, we're going to get you the instrument. We're going to get you the lessons. That's um, a, an example yeah, of sure. what I think what our resource parents do when the kids are at home. Thank you. Would you do us the honor of placing uh, the, the website at last in the chat so that our, our, our listeners and, and viewers can, can read a little bit more about at last and the work that you're doing in Dallas? Um, yes. We're, we're at the end of our time. Um, I want to also encourage those who are listening to please review um, the full bios of our panel. This group of thinkers and doers are amazing. Um, I am feeling lucky and blessed to have had this conversation and to know that you're out there doing the work that you do for, for our kids. And as, as Dr. Bob always closes our meetings, we do this for children and, and that's our hashtag for, for children. So thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you for what you're doing. Looking forward to seeing more and more of what you are doing to provide culturally responsive teaching and learning for our kids. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sharon. That was a uh, outstanding presentation. Um, I could actually see that one going on for another hour. Just uh, great Absolutely. insights, and uh, um, but we'll, we'll we will keep pressing on because we have some equally uh, great presentations to come. Uh, next up is Sharmali Roy. Sharmali is also uh, a member of the Children at Risk Family, director of our Center for Social Measurement and Evaluation. And, uh, and she's going to share with us uh, some, some points on uh, data and creating an inclusive playing field. Sharmali. Thank you, Mr. Bowers. Um, hi, everyone. I am going to refer back to something we started off this morning discussing, um, and I think a lot of the other speakers have also touched on is this, um, the concept of, um, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, redlining and, and just the history of it. So I just wanna ground this um, and then I'll keep moving on because we've already discussed some of this stuff. Um, so referring back to the maps that um, Dr. Nelson shared earlier, zoning laws and exclusion from owning property existed in many areas after slavery was abolished and the Supreme Court made this illegal. Um, then in the 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal agency listed um, neighborhoods considered high risk or hazardous as redlined uh, for lending institutions. And then Fair Housing Act in 1968 made this illegal. Um, in the meanwhile, school integration after Brown v. Board of Education brought more students together, even if uh, the neighborhoods that they came from continue to be segregated. Um, I'm sorry, there's a storm going on outside of my house in Houston here. Um, and then throughout the 70s onward, a lot of white flight to suburbs took place driven by decisions um, for schooling of children as described in the example of Pasadena here in, um, here in Texas. 
And in the 90s, districts are released from court oversight for desegregation. So a lot of the schools that had been were on the watch list or were being observed for how they were actually doing some of the um, integration work are then released from those um, oversight. Um, and then overall, redlining contributed to racial wealth gap which unchecked has taken many forms, um, like gentrification, where wealthier people have more have moved into low-income neighborhoods. So there's a little bit of you know back people moving back into the neighborhoods that they had moved out of before. So there's a lot of redistribution as as well as demographic change. Um, next slide, please. So today, um, I'm sorry, give me one second. Racial segregation and economic segregation um, overlap. So redlining denied access to capital investment, which could improve housing and economic opportunities for residents. Um, and then household income and home values in white neighborhoods are today twice as high as those in segregated communities of color. Um, neighborhood poverty rates in segregated communities of color are three times higher than in segregated white neighborhoods. So these are the, this is the state of things today. So just like some of the legacy and just structural things that have stayed behind. Um, next slide, please. So segregation today. Um, Black and Latino students on average attend schools where a far higher share of poverty measured by eligibility for um, free and reduced lunch. Um, so what that looks like is like 81% of metropolitan regions where most more segregated in 2019 than in 1990. Again, going back to some of those um, desegregation rules being taken away or um, not existing anymore. Uh, about 1,000, and, and again, so sorry, just to like ground this again, that some of this de um, desegregation rules applied a lot to the Southern states. Um, and uh, so to not equally to all of, all, all of the US. And um, about a thousand less per student is spent in high poverty districts than for those educated in the wealthiest. This is today. Um, when including early education, wraparound services like referral to social and other su student support um, areas, the gap is increased to about 2000 difference between um, what's being spent in high and low income um, students. So, an analysis of local location data um, that kind of looked at people's movements in terms of taking phone location um, information and travel data in the 50, um, I'm sorry, uh, the data here on, I can, I, I can come back to this um, in a second. I just don't want to um, build, um, take the time from the other speakers moving on, but then I can I will definitely address the question you're asking there. So an analysis of location and travel data in the 50 largest states. So thinking about people's, you know, um, is in social media where you're locating and where you um, tag on to where you are when you go to different businesses and whatnot. Um, the cities found that in urban areas, people of different races don't basically they don't patronize the same businesses and they don't go to the same um, Places socialize in the same places. Um, so before moving on, where do you think schools are the most segregated? If I can have a couple of answers, um, this is about all over US. Anybody has any answers in the chat? <laughs> That's actually, uh, some of these are really great. Um, so that's actually, somebody had the correct answer. So New York City, can you go next slide, please? Um, so New York City is today in terms of intensity of segregation, um, the typical white student attended a school where there are more than 60% of white peers, while a typical black student and the typical Latino student attended schools with about 25% white students. So um, there, are cities that you know we don't expect to have this level of segregation, but like you're saying, like New York City is one of them, and I think that's because it's also been in the news recent um, with a lot of um, uh, great writing um, by by scholars around this. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is just talking about Houston, and it, again, one of the answers was Houston. Houston schools are just as segregated now as they were 50 years ago. So this is, um, you know looking back at what's happened in terms of it's almost come full circle. Um, next slide, please. 
Houston is probably one of the most diverse regions in the Texas. And then if you look at the teacher to student ratio, many students who are of color may only have white teachers. Um, and in region four, which includes Houston, but as well as the some of the other outlying um, um, cities, only 30% of black students and 45% of Latinx students are considered college ready when they graduate. So this is an, those two things don't have to correlate to each other, but just thinking about like what the state of things are and what it means in terms of, uh, if we consider the last panel, um, what it means to be recognized by your name, by people who look like you. Um, and again, I'm going to move on because I don't want to keep from other um, speakers. So from the 2020, um, I'm sorry, I only have seven minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to come back to this question. Um, so for the 2020 school rankings, Children at Risk Developed Racial Equity Index, which is a measure of how well schools are serving students of color. The measure looked at performance um, of all students, performance of students of color and performance of those who are economically disadvantaged. Uh, and I'm sorry, I'm speaking so fast. It's just, I only have, I'm over my time. Um, and so when looking at that, these were, so those are the three areas of, of information that was used. So following the highest ranking schools at children at risk, uh, new racial equity indicator. This is the mix, mix of um, you know, traditional public schools, charter schools, and magnet schools. These five schools have high proportion of students of color, economically disadvantaged students um, with lower disparities between the highest income and lowest performing students. So again, I, I can um, go back to the methodology and, and follow up with the questions, um, but I don't wanna keep from the next um, person on, in, our, in our panel. Um, next slide, please. So it's just thinking about the segregation outcomes, there are consistently strong correlations between the degree of racial and residential segregation and key life outcomes, such as poverty rates, home value, rent, educational outcomes, life expectancy, economic mobility, and more. Um, black children raised in integrated white neighborhoods earn nearly $1,000 to $4,000 more as adults um, than when they are raised in highly segregated communities of color. Um, so just, you know, like, again, what are some things that happen, things over lifetime, things that aggregate over structural things. Um, so it's not correlation exactly directly like causing causation, but if you think about the structural aspect of things, what are some things that sort of barriers that just kind of build on top of each other. Um, as you know, students raised in integrated or white neighborhoods earn about, you know, anywhere from 900 to 5,000 more per year as adults than those raised in highly segregated communities of color. Um, and then I'll just move on to give our space to the next speaker and I'll answer questions that were in the chat, thanks. Thank you very much, Sharmali. Um, next up, we have Isabel Lopez. Isabel is executive director with NestQuest and she's going to share information about how NestQuest helps families access quality and affordable housing and also public education. Isabel? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you guys for having me. Um, so NestQuest is a small but powerful nonprofit that was founded in 2017. We do specialize in maximizing housing vouchers and finding stable housing um, in areas that are zoned to A plus to be rated uh, public schools. We do utilize the children at risk ranking system for those, uh, those grades. Participants that are in the Housing Choice Voucher Program, also known as Section 8, have limited options for high quality housing in safe neighborhoods. So we work directly with those families, the landlords and other government agencies to give them a real choice in where they live as well as where their children attend school. Obviously, our ultimate mission is going to be to break the cycle of intergenerational poverty and systemic segregation in schools. Next slide. Um, according to a study done by Rice Kinder, um, they reported that the Houston Housing Authority, which is our largest housing authority in this, in this area, uh, that 57% 50 of households on the Housing Choice Voucher Program were households with children. 86% of households were led by women with a gross annual income of about a little bit over 13,000. And on the Nest Plus Program, our, all of our families are 100% female-led households with school children. Next slide. So on this map, 
you can see where voucher holders are able to lease uh, using their vouchers. What you also see on this map is all of those areas where voucher holders do not have any presence. Next slide. When it comes to the school rankings in this first map, you're gonna see all of the blue markers representing a high performing A or B ranking school. Next. Our second map, you see the red markers for every low ranked school in the same areas. And then finally in our last map, you'll see the combine showing both um, and the gaps across high and low ranked schools. So these two maps, what we've done is we've overlapped the areas where voucher holders and low ranking schools, this is the map that's on your left, you'll see that they sort of correlate where you, uh, the more voucher holders you have in the area, the higher uh, number of low ranking schools are. And then in the map on your right side, you'll see that all the blue markers for high performing schools are not as present in the areas where voucher holders are uh, predominant. Next slide. So we do encourage each family to consider uh, the long-term benefits their family will receive. According to the data, the long-term benefits can impact the child's GPA, their chances to graduate and attend college. Families with stable housing and education will also see health benefits and even a reduction in teen parenthood and incarceration. Next slide. So when we're searching for properties, we discuss the needs and wants of each family. This includes the parents' desire to place their child in a school that may be more diverse, a variety of school programs and educational support. So here we see how the rankings differ based on the ranking system that we use. As we compare the children at risk rankings against the ranking system of the TEA, we can clearly see that the children at, rank, uh, children at risk takes their ranking system even further than an A, B, or C grade. The additional breakdown also allows NestQuest the ability to really see how schools differ from one to another. Next slide. So since 2017, uh, NestQuest Houston has utilized the Children at Risk Ranking System to assist over 60 families in relocating to units zoned to high-performing schools. This is a total of more than 200 children We've talked a lot about data and placement of vouchers. I think it's important that we share what we have seen in our NestQuest families. So you'll also see um, that our average size household is anywhere between three and four family members. These are single mother households um, with an average student age of 12. Uh, one of the greatest things that we have noticed in the transition is that despite having to move from one school to another, we have been able to maintain a 100% graduation rate from school to school, grade to grade, um, as well as for high school students in their last years of high school. Next slide. So finally, uh, we have really enjoyed helping all our families reach their definition of success in this move. Um, so here's just some of the feedback that we have received from our moms. Um, this mom in particular basically wanted to thank us for the change in the schools. They see the difference and how it's brought out the best for their kids. Um, and obviously day by day, that's getting better for them as well. Next slide. Um, this family, uh, the mom wanted to acknowledge that her son is now in a school that supports his education needs, so he's thriving, versus where he was before, where he was stigmatized for his behavior, um, and the school just was not equipped to assist with that. So they obviously are thanking us for their uh, for the help in relocating them to a school they can actually support their son. Thanks, thanks so much, Isabel. Um, it's great work that you guys are doing uh, within the community. And uh, you know, one of the things that I take away from this is that uh, we don't have to touch thousands of people to be difference makers. And uh, and you all are doing such great work, one family at a time. And uh, we thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. For yeah. 
Great. So now we'll move to the keynote part of our presentation today. And uh, we've got two great, wonderful speakers, um, Helen Stagg uh, with, uh, with Change Happens and Darrell Bradford with 50 Can. And so they're going to engage in a dialogue on community solutions to improving student outcomes. And we'll turn it over to Helen and Darrell. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having me to Children at Risk. I appreciate it uh, and being invited to participate. And I'd also like to say hello to uh, uh, Darrell today. We want to talk about communities and the role that they play. So uh, Darrell, before uh, I ask a question uh, of you, do you have any uh, greetings that you'd like to give at this time? Um, so uh, I would like to thank Children at, uh, at Risk for having me today, and uh, 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 a big shout out to uh, Mr. Bowers for quarterbacking our event today, and certainly great to see you uh, for the second time on Zoom, Helen. Is it okay if I call you Helen? That's fine. Thank just you. Wanted make, just want to make sure. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I came from a good household. I just want to make sure. So. Okay. Well, let me start off uh, by asking you to share an experience that you had in your childhood or as a professional as well, that most firmly brought home to you what inequality means and why it is important that you keep that thing in mind uh, as you do your work today? Yeah, so, uh, so it's a great question and, and, and uh, uh, thank you for asking it. You know, I, I thought really hard about how to answer this and there, there are legion instances of this from when I was a kid. But I really just want to bring it up date. The last 18 months have been the like the, the most inequitable series of inequitable moments all stacked on top of one another uh, in, in my lifetime, and I think in, in most people's lifetimes. And certainly we saw in sort of uh, uh, the deployment of, of, uh, of um, vaccines, the de deployment of of uh, help related to jobs around the pandemic, and and most certainly in education, that our uh, you know our nation is sort of hardwired for a, inequity in the, in a lot of ways, um, and because of that, like when when you when you rip the covers off as as we have done, um, it's it's all there, and and so just you know sort of like a sharp a, a sharp instance of this, you know, in New Jersey where, where I am, I mean, like the Newark Public Schools, for instance were closed the whole time, basically, or almost the whole time. My, my good buddy who lives in Rumson Fairhaven, which is like a, a bedroom community of, of Wall Street types, they were doing five days in person, uh, you know, in December or whatever. So it's sort of when the, when the first data started coming back. So, I mean, there, there are hundreds of other instances like that, like this, but the last 18 months of K-12 schooling in America have gone a, a long, have been probably the worst thing I've seen in a very long time. Thank you. You know, I was uh, born in the era of civil rights, right when Board versus uh, Board of Education, Brown versus Board of Education in 1952. And I grew up in a segregated community in, in a segregated town in East Texas. And I, re but I remember mostly from that is the protective factors that were in place for me, my community, my family, the church, the school, all of that in that segregated community. And so I didn't feel less than, and I wasn't made to feel that way. But when I went away to college, I went to uh, an integrated college, albeit there were fewer blacks and whites there. But I remember even the face of the professor at this even now, 50 years later, of being looked at indifferently, like I didn't matter, that my ideas and opinions were less than. And that, if I had not had that protective factor that came from my community, I'm not sure how I would have responded to that. And I think what we see in many instances, particularly with African-American children, is that uh, they are in a world where people may not even know that they exist or they feel like they don't matter. And I believe that that's one of the things that communities can do to help try and enrich 
those opportunities and provide that kind of protective factors that I felt in my community when I was growing up in a segregated Southern uh, East Texas town. Can I ask you then, um, why should communities uh, help in the fight to integrate public schools? And how is that going to benefit our future generations? Yeah, I, I mean, what a, what a good and provocative question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I think, so here's the, here's the first thing, right? So I'm inclined to believe, right? And, and not inclined is the wrong word to describe it. I do believe that an integrated society is a better one, right? And, and that proximity and these things, they matter, you know, it's like, it's hard to hate up close, right? And, and certainly our civil and civic and, uh, and proximal differences, right? That we're not close to one another have a huge effect on how we deal with one another. And that, that's not, not always good. Um, at the same time, I think it's problematic to offer school integration as the magic bullet to all of our, our, our problems um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is that, you know, it's, it's interesting. You see that the, um, the fastest growing, and I know it was mentioned earlier, the fastest growing rate of uh, the fastest growing segment of homeschoolers in America are, are African Americans. And if you ask African Americans, as, as I happen to, and I wish more people did, why, why they do these things, there is no one answer. But one of the surprising answers is that they don't feel like they get a fair shake in terms of community representation and respect from their traditional district schools. So they're like, well, I'm gonna go do it on my own. I'm gonna build an environment where my kids feel um, uh, uh, wanted, respected, and like who they are and who their ancestors were matters, right? And so uh, on the, uh, it is very difficult to believe that we can reorient the American public education apparatus quickly to ensure that the kids whose, pe whose parents grandparents and everybody else have had the hardest time with it, get that same respect. So I, I just wanna throw that out there. The second thing on top of that is that um, the definition of integration, I think, is not nuanced enough to deal with the changing face of America right now. And so basically we're shoving everybody into uh, like a black white paradigm when there is substantially more diversity between those two things than we've had at other points uh, in the history of the country. And I don't wanna be naive, obviously the, the paradigm between our people and white people is the one that has most substantially shaped public education in America, right? And, and where it is and how it is distributed or not distributed. Um, but it is, it, like there are lots of people that don't fit neatly into that, including lot, lots of Hispanic people who live in Texas, right? Who do not have the experience of African-Americans uh, uh, in East Texas or in Baltimore, uh, where I'm from. Uh, and then just the, the third thing is, is that, and again, I, I think integration is a laudable goal for our schools of all types. Um, but I also think that's a conversation that needs to be had with Black people, um, because they're not like, not all Black people think that integration is an unalloyed good, and not all Black people believe that integration is the top, the, the highest priority for fixing K-12 or even for the, a, the, a positive academic experience for their children. So, so I, I think it's very nuanced uh, discussion, and the more people are open to having that discussion, the, the, the more sort of diverse and inclusive solutions we can have. Thank you. Yeah, and I certainly agree with you as well. You know, I, I had mentioned Brown versus Board of Education when it came before the Supreme Court in 1952. And you know, at that time, our own Thurgood Marshall argued before the court uh, that the, uh, there was not an equal protection, that there are separate education, that those kind of facilities inherently were unequal. Uh, so I do believe and I agree that school segregation kind of lies at the center of inequity and that, you know, when you have students who are in segregated schools and segregated by race or poverty, we all know that they're going to have a much harder time graduating from high school, going on to college. Of course, that feeds into getting jobs and earning income that will allow them to support themselves and their family and building, uh, closing the wealth gap that exists as well. Uh, so we, in order to kind of deal with that kind of racial inequity, I think we do have to address 
uh, segregation. And as you said, it's a complex kind of issue. It deserves to be researched and looked at more with more nuanced approach to it. But we know that schools are that one place that can provide these kind of sustained opportunities for the kind of dynamic social interactions that come with people from different backgrounds and different races. And so they come together and they have an opportunity to learn about the differences that they have. I also believe that we can measure how effective public education is about how we teach that kind of function, how we live in a pluralistic society, a democratic society where we share power and where we share resources and how we can create a society uh, that's really more equitable for all. And you get that through that kind of integrated uh, public uh, education. But that brings us, so your last statement brings us to another question. Uh, how can schools and communities uh, advocate uh, to look at what the community can do to help facilitate uh, effective learning and improving schools and academic achievements? Yeah, it's a, it's a good good question. There's probably like a hundred answers I could give you. None of them complete. So I, I will I will try a, a, a couple. Well, one of them just seems really um, really obvious, um, but it's actually it's hard in the execution. Is it? You just have to bring more people in. Um, so I can tell you uh, uh, like a million anecdotes of a school, uh, you know, a neighborhood public school that says we love the parents there, but every parent is greeted with sort of like skepticism or disdain when they show up to find out what's going on or sit in a classroom or find out like, or, or ask why their kid is getting one teacher instead of another teacher, right? And so you can't have a collaborative process where collaboration is sort of um, uh, uh, incidental on, on one side and desired on the other. So that's kind of the, the first thing. Um, the second thing I would just say is that like, um, and you know, I'm a, I should, I should say it, I heard it's like a four letter word earlier, but like, you know, I'm a school choice supporter, right? And so the, the development of new ways to educate kids is a way that you, that you engage communities, right? I mean, in, in a lot of respects, and you can look at the, the, the history of, uh, of, of independent uh, uh, private schools started by black people, right? In, in, the, in the wake of the riots, like it, uh, uh, in, in the late sixties and, and elsewhere, right? These, th this was a, a way, a governance way, like a, a civil society way that black folks came together around things that were important to them, right? A around history, around goals, right? And built learning institutions. We see this at higher ed, like at high, in, in higher ed, nobody thinks this is Unfamiliar, right? People, people love the concept of HBCUs, you know. Um, and I, I think we should extend that same sort of um, openness, creativity, and willing to make the new to uh, to what we do in K twelve. I think that's the second thing. The the last one I would just say is that so I happen to be um, uh, I'm happy to, to be a person who believes in results, right? Um, and I think. Uh, you know, particularly when we look at some of the learning loss data that's going on right now, like these results matter a lot. Uh, McKinsey just did a study that said the average bl uh, black student in America has like six months worth of unfinished math instruction because of the pan pandemic. This is a nightmare. This requires like all of our attention. People are fighting over whether or not we should call it learning loss. I mean, it, it's, it's like a joke compared to the severe, to the severity of what uh, a lot of kids of color, in particular, um, uh, uh, are, are going to face. But I think what lives next to that is new definitions of what success is that don't throw out the fact that, like, objectively, there are some things all people need to know, right, and need to know well. Like, if, if you're not reading well by the time you're in the fourth grade, I think we all know that absent a significant and expensive reading intervention, you may never, you may never read that well, and so your life outcomes are going to be, are going to be ablated, right? Your ability to feed your family is going to be blunted. Like, this, this is not a good thing. Um, but different communities value different things and want different things. And the, the process of figuring out what we want together and how we reach those goals is, is uh, I, I think, a great way to involve lo local folks in schools and ultimately in, uh, in education. Right, and I think we, we both agree that communities should be involved in, in working in partnership with schools. So 
you know, some of the things that, that they can do to build on what you said as well is that they could advocate within the local school districts to, uh, to have more community engagement, to have the, the schools to listen to the community, to seek out the community, to be really proactive in asking for uh, feedback and listening to what they say and various ways to do that whether it's community forums or whether it's having surveys of focus groups, but to be actively engaged in that. Can I, can and, I, can I jump onto that? Yeah. So, you know, like, so at, at 50 can, we are in the, we are in the work of advocacy, right? And, and we try, we try to pass laws that we think will improve how education is delivered in about 10 States in the country. And so I just want to say to anybody who's listening to this, um, it's good to be heard, but it's insufficient. Right, there are, there are other things you need to do. So you can go to a school board meeting and you can give them a piece of your mind and it sort of ends there un unless you are prepared to do other things like offer a, a policy alternative to what the current thing is. Like angst alone is not enough, right? Um, unless you yourself are prepared to run for school board, right? Because you don't like what the current person sitting on the books, but the, the school board is doing, right? Um, unless you are willing to advocate a law that says, you guys don't want to listen to me, I'm going elsewhere, right? I mean, the, the, these things are all different ways that you assert pressure on, uh, on political entities and schools are obviously political entities. So I just wanted to throw that out there too. Yeah, and I think those are really good points. Uh, you know, we've been engaged in working with uh, a particular issue of, of naming of a, a football field and making it available for community use. So, so a community will have access to have uh, exercise. And, in, in, uh, in Texas, a football field, that's, that's a big deal, right? <laughs> we're trying to renovate it and we wanted to, to name it, but we also want it to be available for this uh, marginalized community to have access to. Uh, and it takes a lot of work to interact, to get a policy in place, to name a school or a policy in place to open it up for community use uh, that's going to benefit a community, not only in terms of physical health, but social health and uh, maybe even some economic opportunities for work and all of that. Uh, but as you mentioned, it takes commitment. It's not just going and to the school board meeting and talking about it, it really takes a lot of work and commitment to keep pushing. And when you come up against barriers and setbacks to refocus and plan a way to, to try and, and get that policy through. So, and I think that's another way that communities can help by not only advocating for that, but also in working with community residents to train and to teach and to empower and build those kind of advocacy uh, efforts in people of the community so that they can lead uh, the way for their own communities as well. Hel Helen, can I throw one, one thing on top of that? Mm -hmm. I, if, if there's one thing that the, um, that the pandemic I think has taught us is that there is there's, uh, an, an ocean's worth of will, desire and ingenuity in communities to help solve both their own problems and very specifically problems of education. And that's what we'd like the, the movement for like local tutoring and mentorship, right? uh, uh, pods and micro schools, right? Like I, I, I always, the New York Times had this great piece where they were like, these pods are inequitable. And I was like, no, I went to one. It was, the, it was the lady who lived next door to me in Southwest Baltimore who was watching everybody's kids back in the seventies when I was a kid, right? And she looked out for us and we went, we did, this is the entrepreneurial, you know, world of, of, of women of color and it has been forever, right? So I, I do think it's, it's also important for people to like recheck and be like, there is a great deal of support and a great deal of energy and a great deal of expertise in local communities that we can use to solve problems of education uh, among other problems. Yeah, so often we look at the problem and we don't look at the opportunities and the assets and we don't well pull that in. We're so busy focused on that other issue. And we don't look at the fact that a lot of that talent and assets and resources already exist in that community. And we're really quick to either not uh, engage or to think that its community is so such a barrier. 
you know, community is messy. So it's not easy. Uh, and so recognizing that when you go in, but that commitment to work with and to just stick it out and determination to work with certainly can, uh, can help build a network of committed people who trust uh, that you are there to help and you're, that you're listening to what they say. Absolutely. Thank you. So you mentioned COVID-19 and the pandemic and before. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you believe that have become more acute uh, and how can communities uh, play a role in addressing some of those challenges? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the important things that I, I was given to talk about this the other day, and it, it, I'm really upset about it. So in, in 2018, no, in 2019, only 18% of black fourth graders in America read at or, or above proficient on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. So I, I do wanna to highlight to people that it's like, for, for black kids in particular, like broadly, the American public education system is, is a train wreck, right? I mean, like, like I, I know there are good people in it who are doing a good, a good job, but you know, only 20% of the people are getting the, the, the desired outcome and that's, unacceptable. And part of what has been lost in the melee around COVID is that people want to return to normalcy and that that alone is the goal. And I'm like, I don't want to go back to 18% provision. I, I think that's that's unacceptable, right? So I, I just want to highlight that to frame the question. Um, the, the best thing, if there is any best thing that has happened about COVID is that, um, you know, the calls to have more local people, more families, more civic institutions, more churches, whatever, engaged in the education of children have been, have been met, right? They, 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 to have parents more involved, whatever, ha have been met, right? They've, they've been met under duress and they've been met as a product of uncertainty, right? But they have been met and it would be a disaster, li literally a disaster to ignore that and exchange it for um, the, the governance of the mono system we had before, right? So, so if there's any sort of opportunity, like, like tutoring, for instance, you know, like a, they, they call it high dose. I keep telling people don't call it high dose. Um, but the, the move to tutoring, which was sort of like the intervention that rich people had in perpetuity that now people seem to realize is good for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful opportunity to engage a universe of people who are not working in schools in the act of supporting the growth of children, right? Academically, socially, I mean, we, you know, we heard a little bit about, the, uh, about this earlier. Um, uh, 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 and, 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 and that's an incredible, that is a generational opportunity to add something to public education, however you wanna define that, that, that existed on the fringe book before. Um, so I would just point to that. I think the, the other uh, kind of quick thing on it is that, and somebody talked about it earlier, you know, rich, rich parents have been investing in enrichment for a long time. They spend um, like at minimum double what non-rich parents do on trips and, and all this other stuff with money from the American Rescue Plan, which is, which is significant. And I will just say it's outrageous in its significance. Um, every museum and every town should be open for the next two years. Right? There's no reason why any kid who wants to but black, white, purple, or otherwise, who wants to learn golf, lacrosse, crew, uh, piano, or whatever, over every break in the next school year, shouldn't have a school district that can pay a local community, a local organization or a tutor to do it. Like we have a, a an amazing opportunity to sort of like use all of the resources available to a municipality to intervene on behalf of kids who've had more, almost three years of disrupted learning. I, and, and I would like to see that as well. Thank you. Darrell, we're coming to the end and the close. It's been a quick uh, 20 minutes or so. And I just like to uh, take this opportunity to thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, I think it's been a stimulating conversation. I wish we could have gone on a little longer. Do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to add? No, uh, so uh, again, th th thank you for having me. Um, you know, if, if anything, I would just say, like, uh, I want to go back to the same theme, that we should not go back to normal. And the best things that have happened during this time of tragedy are things we should keep. 
Uh, and so the like the transformation of of American education, like, and I, and I don't say that um, as like a as, as like a slogan. That actually needs to happen. Um, and there's never been a time I think where more people where, where so, so much egalitarian discontent has existed, right? Where where pe people across all incomes, races, and places are all sort of looking at education, saying we should do something differently, and and it would be tragic to let that moment go away. Great, thank you. You know, and on behalf of organizations that are working and people and individuals that are actually w working in the communities and like my organization, Change Happens, you know, we recognize that um, and we understand that a good education is, is a lot more than test scores. It's all of those other things that you mentioned. It's physical and mental health, it's the arts, it's music, citizenship responsibilities. It's having those emphatic relationships. All of those are equally important. And that's what communities can provide and help to sustain and community-based organizations can as well. Uh, and we all recognize the importance of education, uh, what's taught and what's not taught. So we, you know, trying to focus our resources to support family functioning uh, as well and closing those kinds of achievement gaps. It would benefit not only the children, families, the economy, and this, you know, our society as well. So thank you uh, for having both of us today. And uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. I'll turn it over to the uh, moderator. Thank you, Helen and Darrell. Uh, what a great way to close out our program today. Um, you know, I was going through the the chat and and looking at the comments and uh, some of the questions that were being raised and uh, one of the one of the comments I noted was amazing conversation and knowledge building and I think um, the fact that you're here and you've recognized that children at risk does create a platform uh, to bring uh, experts together for conversations like this and for knowledge sharing. Uh, we would just encourage you that as you continue on your journey with, with your organizations to uh, consider our Children at Risk uh, website, childrenatrisk.org, and uh, pay attention to upcoming events and things that are happening. Uh, on September 22nd, we will have a State of Latinx Children in America program. Uh, coming up on September 23rd, we'll have our Speaking Up and Speaking Out luncheon. Uh, and then on October 8th, we will have Accolades, which is our Academy Awards for uh, uh, individuals and organizations that are making a difference in child advocacy across uh, multiple platforms. And so um, please keep an eye on those. Um, I also would like to give a virtual round of applause to all of our speakers. Um, you know, just wonderful contributions helping to set uh, context around historical discrimination practices, contributing to the segregation, school segregation problem, uh, some of the inequalities of the virtual education uh, system that we've been having to manage through over the last year and a half. Uh, also learning some great tips on cultural or cultural responsive teaching and learning uh, approaches, and also on solutions to improve student outcomes and level the inclusive playing field. Uh, just a wonderful uh, set of uh, 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 learnings that we all were able to get today. Uh, and it wouldn't be possible if it were not for our sponsors. Uh, and they're listed on the screen that you see now, uh, in particular, uh, Shell, who has been with us for many years. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your support and sponsorship. Um, take your phone really quick and take a picture of the image on the screen to be able to complete the uh, event survey. Uh, just another way for us to continue to improve our uh, process and what we deliver uh, and making sure that we're meeting your needs. Uh, I'll close with one other personal story, no pictures this time, but um, this is a story about uh, Beniva Williams. Some of you may have heard of Beniva Williams. When she was 14, she attempted to enroll at McReynolds Junior High School, uh, which was walking distance from where she lived in the Fifth Ward community in Houston. Uh, and despite the fact that the Supreme Court uh, had uh, two years earlier 
you know, affirm the Brown versus Topeka uh, ruling to overturn separate but equal schools. When uh, Beniva went to make Reynolds Junior High, she was actually turned away. Uh, in a 2004 interview, Beniva noted that there were no smiles, no welcoming committees. And uh, when they left the school, uh, they had to do so uh, with great haste. And that after attempting to enroll, their family endured uh, lots of uh, anonymous phone calls and threats. Uh, and uh, it just was not a good situation. Uh, a few months later, Beniva and another child named Dolores became plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit filed by the Houston chapter of the NAACP. And in response, HISD began a grade by grade integration of the schools in 1960. Uh, but that integration moved very slow. And so there were lots of protests from uh, African Americans in the Houston community. And ultimately, uh, HISD reached a settlement with the NAACP and the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund in 1984. Uh, Beniva and Dolores never attended integrated Houston schools. Uh, Beniva actually graduated from Phyllis Wheatley High School and later became involved in social work and public health. And uh, I share that story because, first of all, uh, this is a story I grew up hearing because Beniva is actually my second cousin. And she and her sister would talk about some of the challenges that they faced, why they did what they did, even though at the time uh, they were not optimistic about uh, reaching their goal, but they knew that it would help close the gap further down the road for future generations to come. Like Beniva, I think we all share this commitment to want to improve the lives of children in our communities. We want to be a collective catalyst for change. And our discussions and ongoing discussions from today will help us continue to be uh, this generation's Beniva and Dolores. We'll close the program on that thought and with our traditional children at risk slogan, which is for children. I won't be able to hear you say it. Uh, and well, that's whoever is still on, un undo your mics. Undo your, undo your microphones. And we'll give one big, uh, large uh, group shout out for children. For children. for children. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much again. And I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon.